Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Rural Economy and Connectivities Committee's 11th meeting in 2019. Could I ask you please all to make sure your mobile phones are on silent? Uh, could I also welcome at this stage to the committee Christine Graham and Rachel Hamilton, who will be listening and taking part in parts of the committee's activity this morning. Agenda item one is to deal with this Scott Rail remedial order. This is the committee's consideration of Scott Rail's remedial order. First, the committee will take evidence from the Scott Rail Alliance. Following this, the committee will take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity. I'd like to welcome uh, to the first panel Alex Hines, the Managing Director, David Simpson, the Operations Director for Scott Rail Alliance, and Liam Sumter, the Chief Operating Officer for Network Rail Scotland. Alex, would you like to give a brief opening statement to the committee of no more than three minutes, because there are lots of questions. Thank you, Convener. Uh, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to appear before the committee this morning. The fact that we are sat here today is an indication that the service some of our customers have received hasn't been good enough. Uh, we're sorry to those customers who've been affected, and we know that we must do better. And I'm confident that we will do better through the delivery of this remedial agreement with Transport Scotland. This is a ScotRail plan, and while ScotRail is reliant on infrastructure performing and suppliers delivering, ultimately ScotRail is responsible for the, customers our, uh, the service our customers receive. With this remedial agreement, we will invest an additional £18 million to give our customers the service they expect and deserve. And I'm sure we'll go through the plan in detail, but some of the highlights are as follows. We will recruit an additional 55 drivers and 30 conductors. Hitachi, the supplier of our brand new Class 385 electric trains, will increase the number of technicians on the trains to deal with incidents. We'll increase the number of people working within our control room, including seven additional people from Hitachi and we're doubling our performance improvement fund to half a million pounds a year. We're extending the contract on our loco hauled trains in five to protect capacity and taken together we believe the actions in this 18 million pound agreement will enable us to improve the service our customers receive. There are some positive signs that performance is improving. We recently recorded our fourth consecutive period of improved performance with almost 90% of our 2,400 services a day meeting our punctuality target. That's up from 2,200 services a day at the start of the franchise. In fact, in the most recent four-week period, more trains in Scotland ran on time than ever before. Glasgow Central recently recorded its best period for two years. The performance of our infrastructure has improved significantly. The number of daily cancellations linked to train crew has reduced dramatically, and more than half of the Hitachi trains are now in service. We need to do much, much more to regain the trust of our customers, but things are moving in the right direction. ScotRail will face further challenges throughout the course of 2019. Training new drivers takes 18 months in total. We remain at the mercy of our train suppliers who have let us down badly in the past. And although Network Rail is investing more than ever to prepare for the extremes of Scottish weather, its unpredictable nature will continue to significantly impact Scotland's railway. We are delivering the biggest change to Scotland's railway for generations, reflecting the fact that last year we were the fastest growing part of the UK rail network. Change is difficult, change brings many challenges, but changes will deliver huge benefits for Scotland. And if we weren't electrifying much of the central belt, if we weren't introducing so many new and upgraded trains which will benefit the whole of Scotland, and if we weren't training so many of our people, then our job would be less complex. But we are transforming Scotland's railway and I'm confident that we will get this right. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, the first question then, uh, Mike. Can I just <coughs> say that the apology, Alex, you started with was, uh, I think is a very good way to start, um, for the apology for the passengers that haven't received the service that they deserve. Um, but I'd like my questions to focus on the plans that have been put in place since the contract you took the contract on in two, your company took the contract on in 2015 um, in 2016 you had the first improvement plan and you had 249 action points then <coughs> two years later we've got a second improvement plan 
with 20 measures for improvement. And now we've got the publication of the remedial plan with nine new initiatives in it. So we're looking at these 249 action points, the 20 measures for improvement, another nine new initiatives. Why have they failed to produce the required level of performance across the piece? Well, I don't accept the premise that these improvement plans have not worked. As I said in my opening statement, uh, train series performance on Scotland's railway has seen its fourth consecutive uh, period of improvement. It, I mean, everybody seems to accept... You're saying that they have worked, that... There's no, why, are we, why are we in the position we are in now, then? We're here to discuss today is the remedial plan and remedial agreement with Transport Scotland, which is specifically about the number of cancellations which we experienced early, uh, or late last year, in the east of the country. Um, that's what this £18 million investment is about. It's targeted on those issues which saw at the end of last year. If we look Scotland-wide, across the whole of Scotland's railway network, actually there is evidence to suggest that the underlying performance of Scotland's railway network is improving. We've had our fourth consecutive period of improved performance. More trains ran on time in Scotland last period than ever before. If you look at some of our changes we've made to our timetable in the Glasgow area, uh, into Glasgow Central on the Strathclyde Electric Network, actually we're delivering much better levels of performance there. So this issue which we're discussing today is primarily confined to the train crew issues we've experienced in the east of the country, which is why we're going to invest an additional £18 million to make sure customers get the service they deserve. Well, can I just say, I want to challenge you on that, because the information that we've got in front of us, uh, produced by um, the clerks, um, says that when you took over the uh, Scott Rail performance measurement moving annual average was about 91% when you took <coughs> the, the contract over, and the target's 92.45%, and we're sitting in the last information that we have at 87.5%, according to the information that the clerks have provided to us. So I would dispute your analysis of the situation that things have improved. In fact, they've got worse. And that's, <coughs> and that's why we're here again, um, to see why it's got worse. I think we have a problem if you're saying to us that you don't accept that these improvement plans haven't worked. Because if they worked, these performance indicators would be reaching the target that you're supposed to be at. But I accept that we're not hitting our target, which is why we're working flat out uh, on remedying the issues uh, which cause trains to be delayed so that we can give our customers the service they expect and deserve. So I'm not disputing that we're not yet hitting our targets, but we're working flat out to do so. Mm -hmm. Right, OK. Well, um, can you show how you've taken forward the recommendations in the Donovan report? Uh, show us more in detail how you've taken those forward. So, obviously, we commissioned an independent review of train service performance uh, at the back end of 2017, and we published all the recommendations in the early part of 2018. Um, across Scotland's Railway, we accepted each of those recommendations, and we've implemented them. For example, the cessation of skip stopping, apart from a, a last resort, and the number of skip stops in Scotland is now down by over 80%, which I'm sure is a measure this committee and our customers would um, uh, welcome. Um, the Independent Office of Rail Regulation commissioned an independent review uh, by Nichols of our implementation of the Donovan Review recommendations uh, and published that document. And that confirmed that the Donovan recommendations uh, reflected uh, the best plan to improve train service performance in Scotland's railway and that we were getting on with implementing those recommendations. They identified some areas of best practice here in Scotland, which we were proud of, and it also identified some areas where we could do even better around strengthening our level of programme management resource and governance to make sure we did an even better job of implementing those recommendations. I'll just finish on one last question, if I may. Um, you're not hitting the performance targets, um, and you're not likely, from what the Minister said in Parliament yesterday to my questions, you're not likely to reach the level of service that the contract um, sets out uh, until May next year. And yet 
the government has an opportunity in April next year to give you notice to end the contract. Do you believe by April next year you, your company, will be able to meet the contractual targets that have been set? So I believe that performance is already improving. We don't have to wait until May next year for performance to improve. The way the contract works is it measures the number of cancellations on what's called a moving annual average basis, and therefore it takes a year for uh, historic performance to drop out of that number. So we're not... It, Customers won't have to wait until May next year to deliver an, uh, an improved service. We're improving as we speak, week by week. You will reach, reach the performance targets by April next year. So, in, in respect of the remedial plan, the £18 million investment we're making uh, um, due to cancellations we experienced in the east of the country, uh, customers are already benefiting from improved service delivery, and we expect to be out of breach level by May of next year. That's not because customers have to wait until May of next year. It's because the contract works uh, on a moving annual average basis. Okay. Do you want to come in there? Yes, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Can I just pick up on something you, you just said in one of the responses to Mr Rumbles? Uh, am I correct in assuming that this remedial plan that we're talking about this morning is only to address issues in the east of the country. I was under the impression this was a remedial plan for ScotRail per se to uh, uh, deliver demonstrable benefits right across the country, but it seems from what you said to be purely a focus on the east. Therefore, my question would be for the rest of Scotland, which of the 2016, 2018 improvement plans or the Donovan report are relevant to improving performance in the rest of the country? So, um, on Christmas Eve, Transport Scotland issued us with a remedial notice because of the level of cancellations in the east of the country and an expectation that we would also breach the company-wide PPM limit. Um, we actually haven't breached the PPM overall company um, target. Uh, we do expect to in coming months because of the way the moving annual average works. So the vast majority of the remedial plan, uh, the £18 million investment, is targeted at the issues which we saw uh, pre-Christmas, which were primarily around train crew related cancellations in the east of the country. Uh, that's not to say uh, that the rest of Scotland's railway uh, won't benefit from that, but that is the focus of this plan. Okay, uh, Colin, you wanted to come in particularly on that, that subject, I think. Just to follow up on that, that, that point about, um, obviously, Mike said that um, um, the remedial plan indicates it will take until May 2020 to exit the breach performance level, but when will performance levels on services meet the full performance target set out in the franchise agreement? Are you referring to the 92.5? Yeah. yeah. So our aspiration is to hit that target as soon as possible. Um, it could be as long as 24 months before we reach that target, uh, reflecting that we're trying to shift a moving annual average uh, calculation of train service performance. And clearly, um, it's not just ScotRail issues which uh, cause trains to be late in ScotRail. We're managing uh, external influences like weather, trespass, suicide. We're managing infrastructure-related issues which, of course, are the responsibility of Network Rail. And finally, we're managing ScotRail issues issues, uh, which are primarily around train crew and uh, the performance of our rolling stock. So by continuing improving in each of those categories, uh, our aspiration is to hit the 92.5 as fast as we can, uh, but it could be 24 months until we do that. So, so yesterday, um, during topical questions, the Cabinet Secretary stated that ScotRail were expecting to hit these targets by the end of 2021. Um, but it, I'm just looking at your remedial plan. It puts the projections for PPM at below 90% at this point, and you've just said it's what 24 months before you're likely to meet that. So, 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 were the projections stated by the cabinet secretary yesterday wrong? Because he specifically said um, you were expecting ScotRail were expecting to hit these performance targets by the end of 2021. Uh, what the cabinet secretary said was accurate. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is it, it's not just ScotRail which directly influences uh, what causes trains to run on time in Scotland or not. Uh, and as you will have seen yesterday, 
um, the uh, new control period for network rail in Scotland, which starts next week. Uh, that's the outcome of a regulatory review with the Independent Office of Rail Regulator. Uh, and as part of that process, uh, Network Rail had to set out a expected performance trajectory so we could set the outputs and the funding for Scotland's Railway. And as part of that work, um, it, we set out an expected trajectory to hit 92.5. So our target is 92.5. We want to get there as fast as we possibly can, but it might take us two years to get there. Sorry, sorry I'm confused. You said that the Cabinet Secretary was very clear what he said yesterday, which was ScotRail expect to hit 92.5% by the end of 2021. And I'm looking at your remedial plan on page 29, the, the graph at the franchise PPM forecast. And according to your remedial plan, you don't expect to hit 92.5 at the end of, or basically in December, it's uh, so period 13 um, in, in, in 2021. So uh, I don't, there's no projection in your, your your remedial plan as to when you will hit 92.5 per cent. Yeah. David, do you want to clarify that? Yeah, the graph <coughs> in the remedial plan. Just something. The graph you're looking at, Colin, is is on page 29 of uh, of the remedial plan. Yeah. To me, that only appears, and I may be misreading it, up till the end of. Uh, yes, period 13 is 2021. It's mid-2021. That, that, March that's 21, question, convener. Right? That's yeah. correct, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, sorry, David, you wanted to answer that? Yeah, the graph takes us up to March 21, um, so the next couple of years, um, and shows how the PPM forecast moves the MAA uh, back towards target. So the end of 21 is a point, as both Alex and the Cabinet Secretary have stated, that we expect to reach the 92.5 uh, target, although we are doing everything we can to try to uh, get there before that point. My, my interpretation of the end of the period 2021 is, is obviously period 13. That's what everybody else interprets as, obviously, people interpret that different. So you're absolutely adamant that you will hit that 92.5%. You're absolutely confident you'll do that within this franchise, because so far you haven't. Well, that, that is our projection. Um, clearly, that's not something which is wholly within the direct control of um, ScotRail and not even the railway system, because that is a measure which takes into account all causes of delay. So trespass, suicide, weather, infrastructure related causing delays, train operating cause delays, other train operating cause delays. So that's our target and that's our forecast. Um, I can't guarantee it because uh, ScotRail doesn't fully control uh, the delivery of that um, uh, performance. Richard, you wanted to come in. Yeah. You know, I have to ask, if you watch the programme that's pre presently on inside uh, Glasgow Central, you see that 950 trains go into Glasgow Central a day. How many train journeys are there in Scotland a day? And how many train journeys are delayed, cancelled or uh, not put through because of network rail? Are you actually... One of the other things you should be doing is gathering data and information how much network rail is affecting your business. I'd like to know that. So, um, one of the key benefits of the ScotRail Alliance is that we run track and train together. So, uh, when my team and I get together to review the performance of Scotland's railway, we have the train operating company and Network Rail Infrastructure Manager working together to deliver uh, performance on, on Scotland's railway. So, um, about a quarter of a million customers per day use Scotland's railway. Um, Scotland's Railway is the fastest growing part of the UK rail system and we're operating 10% more services now than we were at the start of the franchise. Um, so uh, generally uh, Network Rail um, uh, is responsible or Network Rail has attributed the majority of the delay reflecting the fact that weather infrastructure in any railway system uh, accounts for most of the delay. Clearly that proportion has sh changed a bit in recent months as we've seen those issues before Christmas, uh, which is why we're sat here today talking about the £18 million investment we're making. Um, so, I mean, it is true to say that there's lots of reasons why trains uh, run on time or, or not in Scotland. They're not all within ScotRail's direct control. 
but drivers, you've no drivers, you've no trains. But you know, I really want to know what's the percentage if we're, we're going to lay the blame at you or at Network Rail. Who, who, I, who I, primarily I, should we lay the blame I, at? I'm not interested in laying blame. I'm interested in getting the trains to run on time, and that's what the ScotRail Alliance is about. Bill, not part of your problem. Well, the remedial plan sets out the remedial plan sets out very clearly what why trains don't run on time. In order for ScotRail to succeed, Network Rail has to succeed. Thank you. Jamie, you want to come briefly in before we move on to the next question? Yeah, I mean, on page uh, 29, uh, you, you say that uh, you're not currently in breach of PPM MAA as a whole, but there is a risk of this during 2019. In effect, is that an admission that things are going to get worse before they get better? No, it's um, the fact that um, in the coming periods, we're not expecting to achieve the same level as we did last year. Therefore, the moving annual average will drop and that will breach the PPM level in the, in the uh, franchise agreement. So you, expect your, so you expect your performance numbers to dip before they rise, is what I'm asking? On the moving annual average, that's So therefore correct. they will get worse before they get better? Um, on a moving annual average basis, yes, but not on a period basis. As I said in my opening statement, uh, we've now had four consecutive periods of improved train service performance in Scotland and more trains run on time in Scotland in the last four weeks than ever before. Um, so there's a difference between the period number, which is the four weekly number, and the moving annual average. The contract works on the basis of a moving annual average. Thank you. So yours is the next question. Under this plan, ScotRail will invest £18 million to give our customers the service they expect and deserve. My question is, where do, where do these funds come from? In other words, are these alliance funds or are these taxpayer funds? And over what period will, will this £18 million be spent? £18 million, in effect, is a £6 million a year investment for three years, and it's fully funded by Abellio ScotRail. Right. And, and are you confident... Uh, Mr. Hines, that this £18 million pounds is enough to achieve what, you, what, you, what you, you clearly have to achieve over that three-year period. And, and, and given that this is only £18 million over a three-year period, to, to me that doesn't sound like a, a whole lot of money in, in the scale of the, the, the Scottish Railway system. So this is an injection by Abellio Scott Rail of an additional £18 million over and above all our existing plans. So, for example, on the infrastructure side, we're already planning on spending 20% more on the operations, maintenance and renewal of Scotland's railway infrastructure. This is an additional over and above anything which has previously been planned um, because uh, we know that we need to do better uh, and deliver this remedial plan so customers uh, get the service they expect and deserve. OK, still, still on the, the money theme, I mean, much of your problems obviously are caused by the late delivery of the Hitachi trains and the, the 125s, the refurbished 125s. So the, the, clearly the companies that were tasked to, to do that job have failed and, and, and are in breach of their contracts. So what financial compensation are you pursuing with these companies to try and uh, get some redress to that fact? You're absolutely right. Hitachi and Wabtec have failed um, and we're very disappointed with both of their uh, performances in that respect and we're working hard with both Hitachi and Wabtec to um, do the best we possibly can to minimise the impact that it's having on ScotRail and Scotland's railway. Um, clearly, the contracts we have with those uh, manufacturers do have a, uh, an element of um, payment adjustments in the event of non-delivery, as does our franchise agreement with Scottish Government. So essentially, we get a money flow from the uh, suppliers who have let us down, and then to the extent that we're not delivering the contract in full, there's what's called a committed out. Put, um, committed obligation payment adjustment where we have to pay uh, penalties to Scottish Government. That's the way it works. I'm just going to bring Stuart in on this particular point because he had some issues here as well. Stuart. Um, yes, I'm reading the remedial plan and by December 2018 you should have had 26 HSTs and you've had two. 
Um, that's the most appalling contract failure of anything that's before us. I just want to be quite clear who is the contract with, because the leasing company is Angel, but we're constantly talking about WabDEC. So in other words, who, who really are you pursuing? Is it Angel or is it WabDEC? So our contract is with Angel Trains uh, Limited. They own the trains. Yep. And Angel Trains Limited uh, are actually project managing the refurbishment of these trains. It was Angel Trains Limited who decided to uh, give the work to WabTech and WabTech have really struggled to deliver that refurbishment programme. So, essentially, that's the way it works through the supply chain. Our contract is with Angel Trains, Angel Trains' contract is with WabTech, and it's WabTech's poor delivery, which has meant that we're uh, not where we needed to be on the delivery of high-speed trains for Scotland. I'm pleased to say that we've now got the third high-speed train here in Scotland. The customer feedback has been absolutely extraordinary and we're really looking forward to working with Wabtech and Angel Trains to deliver the full 26 so we can recreate a genuine intercity network for Scotland. Well, I, I, I really, I'm just wondering why Wabtech have still got the contract when it, with, from Angel Trains. Uh, but I want to just explore Angel a little bit. Who currently owns them? Because I, the last thing I've been able to see, the Royal Bank actually owns Angel Trains. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure they are anymore. I well, I wasn't sure. It's a genuine question. I can get question. back to you about that. I, yeah. su I suspect there are a number of shareholders there. I don't, I don't believe they're owned by banks right. anymore. Right. Well, let me just return then to the fundamental point. Isn't it time for Angel to discontinue the contract with Wabtech and give it to somebody who can actually do the job? Because if you were expecting 26 trains by December 2018 and they managed to deliver now three over that period, isn't it, at the current rate of progress, going to take until 2030 to deliver the 26 trains? Uh, no, it's not going to take until 2030. As you might imagine, we've explored all options with Angel Trains and Wabtech, and that includes termination. Uh, and in fact, we've recently decided that in order to accelerate the refurbishment programme, uh, 17 of the carriages which require refurbishment we're actually going to do at Kilmarnock here in Scotland, which is a good news story for Scotland PLC. Uh, and we're working very hard with Angel and Wabtech on all options to give us what we want, which is the best high-speed tra high train which ever built uh, to create this intercity network. One final little bit, Kimura, on the HSDs, but I'll return it back to you. Um, given that the classics that are unrefurbished uh, have different operating profile and you had not expected to have to train staff to operate them, what is the impact on the training schedule and the deployment of staff been of the failure of WabTech on the HSTs and your necessity of having to put the classics into service? Failure by Angel and WabTech essentially compounded uh, the training issues we saw at the back end of last year in two respects. So firstly, the trains were late to us and therefore the period over which we had to train our people primarily drivers and conductors, was, was compressed, and that made uh, the December timetable change more difficult. And because we had to press what we call classic high-speed trains into service as well as refurbished, that actually added to the training requirement because conductors had to be trained on both the classic HSTs and the refurbished train. So uh, this is a great example of where uh, our suppliers have really let us down and it made worse the issues that we saw uh, at the end of last year. OK, uh, just before we leave the uh, situation of money, um, and it's a question this committee has asked before, uh, Squire Fund is made up of fines for not uh, achieving targets. How much money is in the Squire Fund at the moment? Uh, I'd need to confirm that in writing to you. Uh, you will have seen in January that we announced that um, we reached a two-year high uh, in terms of uh, Squire. We're working really hard on Squire, and it's going in the right direction, and we're really looking forward to that feeding through in better customer satisfaction. Sorry, I don't understand what you mean by the right direction. The Squire Fund is built up of fines as a result of failing to meet targets. So is it going in the right direction, i.e. it's getting more money in, so you'll be able to do more, or is it getting going in the right direction so, by getting less money in? So 
the way Squire works is, uh, which is the toughest service quality regime anywhere in the UK, uh, our Squire performance is getting better and therefore the rate at which the money is paid into the Squire fund is slowing down. So could you explain to me as well what applications you've made to the government to use the Squire fund and what are those specifically for? in the last six months? Well, I mean, there are hundreds of Squire applications well, I, every single year, I, so I, far too many to detail here. But one example, for example, is making sure that every station in Scotland is fitted with real-time customer information, which is something that we're delivering. We also upgraded our stations on the key route between Edinburgh and Glasgow. So there are literally hundreds of these um, proposals we make, Transport Scotland approve them as necessary, and that's something I can follow up in writing with okay. the committee if you'd like. Finally, on the Squire Fund, could you confirm to me if any of the money from the Squire Fund is being used to fund the £18 million pounds that you're investing in the railway? Absolutely not. This is £18 million pounds of new money uh, being funded by Abellio Scott Rail in full. And it, sorry. Now the final question on the Squire Fund is, could you confirm whether you've got any aspirations to use that money to fund cheap travel to compensate passengers for the performance of ScotRail in the last year? So, uh, not at the moment, because we're funding that ourselves. Uh, so in January, we announced uh, a compensation offer uh, over and above the delay repay guarantee for those customers who uh, saw their service particularly affected by the issues that we're discussing today. And that uh, gave customers on a series of weekends uh, in this spring free travel anywhere on the ScotRail network. And as I've said before, that's fully funded by Abellio ScotRail. Thank you, and, and I'm sure the committee would welcome your offer to give details on the Square Fund so that they can consider them after this meeting. The next question is from John Mason. John. Hey, thanks, convener. Um, I think a number of us have questions about staffing and around that area, and my specific one is on the question of uh, staff having to work voluntarily on rest days, which I believe the, the contract and the, the timetable is dependent on. Can you just give us, explain to us how that has come about and uh, where it's going in the future? Well, uh, I mean, it's standard practice uh, across the rail industry in UK to rely on some level of overtime working uh, in all grades, in fact, uh, cleaners, station staff, uh, drivers, conductors. And one of the decisions uh, we've made is to invest uh, further in the number of people to reduce our reliance on rest day working uh, to make our service delivery more resilient and also provide better work-life balance for our employees. So uh, clearly the £18 million investment that we're making over and above our existing recruitment and training plan for train crew uh, is aimed at reducing our reliance on overtime working. So that's always been the case, or as long as you, you're aware of, that's not a new issue so that's it, happened? In UK Rail, uh, an element of overtime working is, is standard. Okay. So m my wider question then following on from that is, in this whole big picture, you, you've clearly got some long-term issues like that as an example as one, and then you've also got these temporary issues of the new rolling stock uh, and then linked to that training up staff and drivers. I mean, how, how much would you say, how much is, do we have underlying problems here that we need to deal with, and how much is it that we just need to wait and see all these new rolling stock and all these new staff come into place, and then almost automatically the thing will settle down? Well, customers don't need to wait to get improved performance because we're delivering improved performance now. Um, and we're working flat out to make sure we get back to the levels that customers expect and deserve, particularly in the east of the country where we saw too many cancellations. So, for example, uh, we finish um, attacking the training backlog at Edinburgh Depot for drivers uh, at the end of this week. So every single driver at our Edinburgh depot will be trained in the brand new Hitachi trains. So we've seen this week our service delivery being better than the previous week because we've got more of our Edinburgh drivers trained. It is true to say that uh, we're spending £16 million a week uh, transforming the capacity and the quality of Scotland's railway and that gives challenge when we're delivering the biggest upgrade Scotland's Railway has ever seen, and we have to deliver a safe, clean, reliable service to our customers. Those are the challenges of change. Um, I'm looking forward to a situation where uh, Hitachi deliver 
Angel and Wabtec deliver some of the big infrastructure projects uh, are completed so we can really focus on getting this system to work really, really well for the people of Scotland. I mean, I'm very enthusiastic about the railway and I'm trying to be sympathetic, but, uh, you know, I get a constituent coming to me and on the one hand they're saying, well, Abellio Scott Rail are basically incompetent and therefore it doesn't matter what they do, they should be replaced. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, my own feeling is more, well, there's a lot of uh, um, new things happening here. There's a lot of hiccups. It's nothing to do with the underlying management. So, I mean, how do I answer the constituent on these two things? So if you take what happened pre-Christmas, it was the late delivery of trains to Scotland's Railway by Hitachi, Wabtec and Angel, which compressed the training programme. We did also have the industrial dispute with RMT, which compounded those issues, which are thankfully uh, now resolved. I mean, those issues uh, would have been faced by whoever was operating the railway at this time. Thank you. Alex has a, a series of questions, I think, on, on, on staffing. So I'm going to take Maureen, uh, John, and then Christine Graham. So Maureen, would you like to? Thank you, Convener. Morning, gentlemen. Uh, yes, can I just explore the HR issues a bit further? I mean, on one graph, we've got between 30 and 40 percent of causes of cancellations um, are train crew. Um, yet you say that you're going to be recruiting 55 drivers and 30 conductors given staff, plan, staff turnover and planned service increases. I mean, what is the level of staff turnover at Abellio ScotRail? And I, I can't see anything that you're recruiting the right people in the right place. I mean, the trains that are cancelled are often first thing in the morning, which would seem to suggest that the right people aren't in the right place or aren't getting out of bed to get the, the train up and running on time. So can you explain a bit more what the HR position is at, in, in Abellio Scott Rail? So um, the issue that we saw pre-Christmas, which uh, is uh, largely resolved now, but not completely, was not an issue in terms of not having enough train crew. The issue was not having enough train crew trained on the new types of train and on the new routes. And so in some cases, we've had to make the very difficult decision to cancel service trains in order as to attack that training backlog, which was made worse by the late delivery of the trains and the issues we saw with RMT last year. So we can eat away at that training backlog. So for example, all the Edinburgh drivers are trained in the new types of trains by the end of this week. And that's why we've seen a steady improvement in service delivery for the last uh, four consecutive <coughs> periods, that's 16 weeks. It's why last period more trains ran on time in Scotland than ever before. And this £18 million investment by Valeo ScotRail is over and above anything we were planning to do anyway. So it wasn't that we didn't have enough train crew, it was the fact that they weren't trained on the new routes and the new traction. If I look at your website and look at jobs available and look at train drivers, it doesn't say we need them across Scotland. It doesn't say that you can train in Aberdeen or Inverness or Glasgow or Edinburgh. So how do we... How do people who are not in the know, because we know that ScotRail employ a lot of families, how can other people break into working for ScotRail? Well, I mean, firstly, we're recruiting hundreds of people in every position in our company, train cleaners, onboard hospitality staff, station staff, ticket examiners, conductors and drivers, because our railway is growing and it's growing fast and we're uh, the fastest growing part of UK rail. And so um, we, we're we delighted by the people that we manage to recruit into our business um, and we recruit and train them and pay them well. And uh, I would recommend the railway as a career to anybody. Uh, and we are very proud of our record of recruiting and training more people. Uh, paying them properly, we're a living wage uh, employer, for example, and giving people skills, uh, not just to do their job, but also to help them get the next job. 
Okay, you haven't really answered what the staff turnover is in Scotland. Turnover is, is less than 5%. We get very low levels of turnover in the UK rail industry because generally our salaries benchmark well with uh, the wider market. And in terms, so how many people would apply for one position as a train we, driver? We get thousands of applications. Every time we go out for drivers, we get thousands of applications. Uh, we pay a good basic salary with a good pension, job security, free travel, and therefore these jobs are very attractive. So the issue is not a, uh, a, a, an attraction issue to the railway. The issues we faced were the training backlog for the reasons that we've discussed. Just on the training aspect, 12 to, and I think you actually mentioned, 18 months <coughs> to train a train driver. Have you looked at any ways of trying to reduce that time? It seems quite a long time. We have. We've been uh, working with the train drivers union to try and reduce that training time scale as much as we possibly can. I mean, we have to remember that these are highly professional, safety critical uh, roles and train drivers have to be trained on all the types of train and all the routes served by one particular depot, which is why it's a very complex task, but it's one of the ways that we keep the railway safe, uh, which is why it takes so long. And can that training be done in different parts of the country or has everybody got to come to Glasgow, for example, for the training? So there is a um, part of common training, so every train driver, no matter which depot they are destined for, uh, has a period of uh, classroom training, uh, which we do from Glasgow, generally. Uh, and then once uh, the drivers have got the generic training, they then go to their home depot, whether that be Edinburgh or Bathgate or Inverness or Fort William, to do the specific training on those specific routes and those specific train types. Just one more. Well, um, we're just, quite... Just one, Maureen, one Maureen, of the, one of the Maureen, problem. Maureen, I'm sorry, it's we very are small. quite... Maureen, we are quite pushed for time. John, I'll try and bring you in at the end. John. OK, uh, thank you. Good, uh, good morning, panel. Mr Hines, um, it seems to me that, and certainly the view of the Scottish Green Party, that there's a structural flaw here when we look at the issues around the train operating companies and the privatised UK rail network um, there's a lot of people need to get their cut but I, I genuinely wish you well in, in your improvement plan because it's our constituents who are standing waiting for trains and want them to run effectively and efficiently um, and I do note that there's 10% more services than when the franchise started but looking at tackling the causes of cancellation can you tell me Mr Hines what is it that's been redacted? There's a few graphs in there, and there's redactions, and we're told they're redacted under... Um, uh, that's permissible under freedom of information. What is that information that we can't see, please? Verify which bit. Yes, um, if you bear with me, please. Uh, there's uh, text removed on page 7. Um, there's, uh, there's a graph removed on page 6, and so on. Throughout. Where, where the detail is either commercially confidential uh, or it relates to the market for um, train crew, uh, we've um, redacted some elements of that where we don't believe it's in the public interest to publish that. OK, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, now, um, 211... A uh, number of train coat key, de key depots, you tell us that ScotRail recruited 72 additional drivers in 2016 17. Um, why was that number recruited at that time, please? Well, the fact is we're recruiting train crew all of the time based on a number of assumptions we make around the timetable, the rate of retirements, uh, train crew leaving ScotRail to go and work for any tra other train operating companies. So we maintain a um, workforce uh, planning tool which looks out three years. It makes a number of assumptions around what we're doing with the timetable, the train types, sickness levels, uh, retirement levels, the age profile of the workforce, the rate at which uh, people might leave ScotRail to go and work for other train operating companies. So it's a very dynamic tool which we update on a four-weekly basis. Um, and, and in the next paragraph, indeed, um, uh, of 211, the second sentence, significantly larger number of drivers and conductors than forecast left ScotRail during 2018. 
turnover rates are reasonably predictable. Um, do you do exit interviews with people leaving at all? We do. And what information do you glean from that, Mr Higgs? Well, um, as, you, as you can see from the remedial plan, uh, historically the driver turnover uh, in ScotRail has been very low, uh, reflecting the, the issues we were discussing earlier on with uh, Maureen. Um, the number of drivers leaving ScotRail increased last year because of the service expansion uh, by other train operating companies here in Scotland. It's not just ScotRail which is expanding its service, so is LNER, Transpennine Express, etc., etc. Um, other train operating companies pay different terms and conditions. Uh, sometimes our drivers fancy a change, they want to drive a different type of train or a different route, and therefore uh, the number of drivers which left uh, the business uh, increased over those historic levels. Um, some of them come back and as part of our remedial plan planning, we have been talking to our recent leavers and actually some are coming back to ScotRail. And the information you've gleaned from these exit interviews, has that resulted in any changes you've done, perhaps regarding terms and conditions at all? Well, um, clearly the terms and conditions for train drivers is something we uh, talk with ASLEF about uh, often. Uh, and in fact, uh, we've been working with ASLEF in a very cooperative fashion to help remedy some of the issues that we saw at the end of last year. So this is an ongoing process. Uh, we work very uh, collaboratively with ASLEF and the Drivers' Company Council to uh, work through um, what it takes to make sure that we deliver a better service for our customers. Thank you. The, 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 the reason I mention these things is because the next sentence goes on to say, in the period August to November 2018, which has an impact for now, this meant we, there were fewer spare staff within rosters to cover training requirements. That's correct. So, so driver numbers do clearly, I mean, I'm, self evidently, driver numbers affect, potentially affect your performance. <coughs> Have so, you recruited enough so to deal with expansion? Are you doing enough to retain staff? So, essentially, um, we, we have drivers to cover train services, we have spares, we have drivers who are training, um, and um, essentially the training, the compressed training timescale due to the late delivery wrong stock meant our service wasn't as re resilient as it should have been. That's one reason why we're investing this £18 million, to make sure not only we're delivering uh, the full train service and improve performance, but our ability to absorb any future risks is better. OK. Um, will the new staff be based at depots best located to tackle routes suffering significant disruption, for instance, the Borders Railway? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, clearly, customers in Borders and Fife have had a very difficult time. Indeed. Uh, I've experienced that at first hand myself. I've uh, been engaging a lot with the public in Fife and MSPs covering that part of the country. And that's because um, the train services in Borders and Fife are served by drivers who uh, reside at Edinburgh Depot. And it's at Edinburgh Depot whereby we've been having to tackle the training backlog due to the delayed delivery of Hitachi rowing stock. Thank you very much. At that stage, it's the perfect moment to bring in Christine Graham. Christine. An interesting segue to me. I mean, as you know, the Borders Railway runs through most of my constituency and terminates there and wants a correspondence with you about failings, including a Sunday when we lost five services. I want to talk about the staffing, which is one of the main issues raised about why trains weren't running. You say in the papers, in the past two years, you more than double the number of staff has been lost. You must have known that was happening. And you knew a timetable was coming in in December 2018. New timetable, meeting more staff. When did you start planning for the necessary crew with both these factors in play? Well, we started planning for every timetable change at the start of the franchise, which is why we recruited so many drivers in 2016 and 2017. Um, we don't actually know that drivers will leave the company until they uh, hand their notice period in, and that notice period is less than the training, training time scale. So, um, as I said before, the issue wasn't that we didn't have enough train crew at Edinburgh, for example. The issue that we didn't have enough train crew at Edinburgh who were trained on the new types of train and on the new routes. Um, Sandra, I'm asking you when you planned. I mean, you must have seen this coming. New timetable in December 2018. You're losing uh, train drivers. You see it's increasing. 
When was any plan put in place to make sure there was sufficient crew to maintain the service in the, in the East Coast, in particular in the borders? We're, we're planning it all the time because this is a dynamic situation. So there's no flaw in the planning? Well, I think clearly with the benefit of hindsight, we could have done a, a better job. Uh, and we're very sorry to customers who experienced a poor service at the and back end of last year. Is... That's why we're investing £18 million to make our service better. Convener with your leave, because nobody's asked about page 25 of the plan, where it says develop and maintain Christine, a plan. Christine, with the greatest respect, I respect you in the well, chamber, and I'd ask you just to let me move on, because Rachel wants to come in and there are other people. Uh, uh, I, thank I you, think Convener. that's fair. Rachel. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Hines, um, this investment and remedial action plan is very welcome. However, I do believe that my constituents believe that it would, is abstract and futuristic. It doesn't deal with the current disgruntled passenger um, hell that is happening for commuters. And I just wondered, what can you say to them? It's not a quick fix. What can, what can you put in place to make sure that uh, people who are being charged extra for nursery fees, who cannot get to work on time, their jobs are on the line, what can you do Regardless of this remedial action plan, what is here now? Because yesterday I was there and the 828 were promised three peak trains, there was two. It's causing overcrowding at Stow. You've already mentioned the issues on Borders Rail. Um, please, they really need to have reassurance. The short answer. Uh, so, Mr. The, Hines, so the please. first thing to say to those customers on the Borders Railway is we're very sorry. We're working flat out to fix the issue. We don't have to wait to spend the £18 million to improve service delivery. Our service delivery on the Borders Railway is steadily improving week by week. And as I've said, uh, finishing the driver training backlog at Edinburgh, uh, which we're going to finish this week, will really help our ability to run all the planned train services on borders and making sure that those train services that we operate on borders are formed of the correct number of carriages. Yours is the next question. Uh, thank you very much. I don't think I'll take a lot of time. I covered the HSTs, which I'd planned uh, earlier. Uh, this week I'll be on 12 trains, two HSTs, uh, 1170, 1158, and eight 385s. Um, the 385s, absolutely lovely trains. Uh, we've got Hitachi personnel deployed. Uh, I see them on the fleet, I see them on the stations, I've been to Craig and Tinney and I've seen the investment that's been uh, made there. How much difference is that hands-on engagement of Hitachi maintenance personnel in particular making to this and how much is that real insurance in ensuring that the 385s deliver on the very substantial potential that these lovely, quiet, comfortable, more spacious trains provide? <laughs> Well, clearly we're delighted that Hitachi has now finally delivered uh, some trains to us. Uh, and we're absolutely delighted that customers love the trains. The feedback we've had uh, from customers has been extraordinary. Uh, clearly, when any new train is introduced uh, and uh, is exposed to um, our uh, people and our customers for the first time, there's a fam familiarity, there's a learning curve. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that the performance of that train uh, in service uh, has been pretty good. Uh, we've gone in at number three in the Lee table charts of uh, new train introduction, which we're uh, pretty pleased with. Um, the technical reliability of those trains has already exceeded that being delivered by the previous class 170 trains. And the great thing about brand new electric rolling stock uh, is that because a lot of the issues are controlled by software, once you get the, the software to work reliably, you get very, very high levels of reliability. So clearly in the short term, uh, we've been putting a lot of pressure on Hitachi to uh, deliver us a train which works well in service, uh, particularly around door issues, which often we see uh, when, when we first introduce a new type of train, which is why you'll see every single day at Glasgow Queen Street and at Waverley and at places like Falkirk High and Croy, uh, technicians from Hitachi deployed so that if our train crew do experience any issues with the train, we're able to respond to that really, really quickly. Yeah. Well, the next question, John Finney. John. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr Hines, the ScotRail Alliance Integrated Control Centre there, you have plans to supplement the staff, I understand four new incident managers, three additional 
train running controllers. Um, what's the existing complement and what difference do you anticipate these new staff making, please? So uh, we have about 75 uh, staff in our integrated control centre uh, made up of uh, both ScotRail employees and Network Rail employees working together as one team. Uh, that's one of the key benefits from the alliance. In fact, we have one control centre with one head of control uh, leading the team for Scotland's Railway. So clearly to improve train service performance, uh, and reflect the fact that we're also operating more services than ever before on a network which is the fastest growing in the UK. Uh, we are, as part of the £18 million investment, we're injecting additional resources into our control centre to help our ability to uh, plan the network and recover from incidents when we see them. So, in practical terms then, what, what difference does that make? Um, I mean, if you have a breakdown, presumably you're able to respond to it now, you what you're going to do. Essentially, it means we have uh, more resources to cope with the issues that we see. So, um, as the network gets busier, uh, sometimes it might be the case that we have two live incidents on the same bit of the network. And by injecting more resources into our control centre, our ability to respond uh, more quickly than that um, that we had before is really important because we're operating so many more services each day, uh, the potential impact of any one incident is getting greater because we're operating so many more services than we did before. Okay, thank you. You, you had a brief supplementary and then uh, we go to Peter. Just on the control centre, I understand there are both ScotRail and Network Rail staff in the control centre. How, and, and I understand that is that unique or unusual in the GB network? And to what extent does that help when problems arise in the resolution? Because, as we know, um, the majority of the problems arise from the infrastructure rather than the operator. So having them sitting together sounds like it helps, does it? it I mean, it does, uh, which is one reason why we have one of the lowest delay per incident anywhere on the UK rail network, because it provides for swift and decisive decision-making. Uh, the best example of that I can give is actually during the beast from the east, where we had a red weather alert for the central belt, and my team and I made the very difficult uh, decision to uh, close the railway in those parts of the railway that were affected so we could get everyone home safe, uh, which we did. And that was a decision that we were able to make as one team without any negotiation with uh, any other parties, which is, tends to be how it works south of the border. You want to come in briefly? Yes, uh, to refer back to my colleague's uh, question, I don't think it's been asked. Um, you've said with, uh, often there's a complaint that a company has too many managers. Do you have enough? Uh, in particular, create a head of operations strategy role within, uh, uh, within the ScotRail Operations Department organisation. Which role shall be responsible for maintaining the three year train crew resource plan? Um, this is supposed to be in by April this year. We, we do have enough managers, but what we're going to do is give this area additional focus as part of the £18 million investment we're making. An operations manager? We're going to create an additional post which is purely focused on the delivery of the three year. When's that person going plan. to start? So they're going to start in line with the remedial plan. In April, next month. Thank you. Peter, what was the next question? Yeah, the, the, the remedial plan highlights a new focus on data collection and analysis and looking at the causes of delays. What, what will this mean in practice and, and what impact can we expect on performance levels from this new focus? So, um, clearly... Um, we collect a lot of data as to why trains miss PPM. So on the UK rail network, any delay which causes a delay in excess of three minutes is attributed down to a root cause. And as the remedial plan sets out, actually the main uh, reason why we've missed a uh, PPM target in recent periods is actually the number of trains which miss PPM by one minute. So these are trains which are six minutes late rather than within PPM, which is four minutes 59. 
And that's why we've made some small changes to our timetable in the Strathclyde electric area, including things like the provision of platform staff in the peaks at Glasgow Central Low Level, uh, who are encouraging better customer management to get customers on board and off trains more quickly, um, to reflect the fact that actually um, a lot of these PPM failures are by as little as 60 seconds. So if we can drag those trains which are currently outside the target within it, we can have a big impact on the public performance measure. Mm. Yeah, I can understand that. I mean, it, it, as you say, uh, it, it, in these cases, a minute can make a huge difference to, 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 your, to your figure. So, um, so this, this should have a real impact then in the figures going forward. Yeah, one of the challenges we have is that the railway systems only measure delay to a minute, and we, we've got to look at seconds here. Uh, one of the things the remedial plan talks about in this data is using GPS data, which the trains have, so we can measure things like the time they take between sections, station dwell times to the second and not to the minute, and that will really help us to target where the trains are losing time at stations and route sections and really tackle these issues much more effectively than with the data we currently have. Yeah, very good. Maureen, you had a question which unfortunately you weren't able to ask earlier. Would you like to ask that now? Um, well, yes, it's kind of out of sync now, uh, which is back to um, uh, HR problems. I mean, we talked about drivers. Um, what we didn't talk about and what annoys a lot of people getting on a train is to be told that there is no tea trolley coming along. And um, that really really upsets a lot of people you think you're going to sit on a train, especially on a longer journey, and not have a cup of tea and a biscuit. Um, why are so, is it so often that there is no tea trolley? And we know that the ones that you have are really good, often they're Eastern European. Is that having an effect? But why are there no tea trolley folk on so many trains? Well, um, the Squire regime uh, measures the delivery of service quality against the contract, which includes whether um, services have um, a hospitality steward on board. Um, clearly, sometimes for unforeseen reasons, uh, we're not able to provide one. Uh, where that's the case, we're sorry, but actually our performance in that respect is much improved uh, because we've been recruiting and training so many people in the hospitality grade as well. So um, we don't always get it right. Uh, it's improving, that's measured by Squire, and uh, our cl clear target is to make sure that every train which should have uh, the ability to buy food and drink on board is uh, provided with it. In fact, we're investing more money in our food and drink offer on board, uh, as we can demonstrate with the intercity service, where we're creating a cafe for the first time and double staffing some of our intercity services. So. Um, in this respect, getting that right is very important and we're getting in the right direction. And it's something that's measured by Squire. And in January, our Squire results were at a two-year high. Okay. I think that neatly leads on to the Deputy v Convener's questions. Gail. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about customer satisfaction. Um, at the last uh, survey in autumn 2018, it's the lowest it's been at 79%. Um, we know that the National Rail Passenger Survey um, samples 30 aspects of service. What are you finding that people are most dissatisfied with? Uh, the overall satisfaction score for any train operating company is primarily driven by the punctuality and reliability of the train service. So um, as part of this £18 million investment we're making in uh, remedying the issues outlined in our plan, then we expect that to have an impact not just on train series performance, but that will th flow through to customer satisfaction because punctuality and reliability is the biggest driver of customer satisfaction. Actually, if you look at the National Rail Passenger Survey, we can see some good increases in those areas that we're investing in. Um, but it's punctuality and reliability which is the biggest driver of customer satisfaction. Okay. Um, and you were issued with a second remedial plan notice. I believe that that's due to be published by the 3rd of May. Correct. Is that we'll be submitting our remedial plan for the National Rail Passenger Survey target on the 3rd of May. Um, clearly, 
much of the territory covered in that plan will, is, is discussed here because it's primarily around train service performance and this £18 million investment we're making will really help us in that respect. And are there any other aspects, as um, Maureen Watt mentioned, about trolley service and uh, anything else that you're planning to have as proposals in that plan? So um, we're still compiling the plan, um, but I would say that we are working really hard on Squire and we're going in the right direction so customers can look forward to uh, more reliable services, cleaner trains, better stations. Uh, the investment we're making across the network in making that happen is feeding through into better Squire results. Okay. Okay, uh, there are a few other questions that committee members want to ask. Jamie, you wanted to ask uh, oh, uh, one, I think. Th thank you. It's, it's really just a point of clarification on a few things that have come up over the discussion. Can I just check a few things? In the remedial plan, it says it takes 12 months to a driver. In your opening statement, you said 18. Which is it? It varies by depot because it depends on how many routes and how many types of train uh, a driver has to learn. So it varies based on a depot by depot. Okay. So worst case scenario, it's 18 months where we have lots of routes and lots of train types. In other places where there's maybe just one route a driver uses and maybe one type of train, it's, more, uh, it's quicker than that. Um, another one is uh, another point of clarification on the HSTs. Is it the case that you will be uh, introducing unrefurbished HSD classics onto the network in the absence of the ability to refurbish them? We've already done that. Right. We did that at the back end of last year. Um, so each day we have um, 10 sets of services which rely upon high-speed trains. Uh, and so um, today, for example, we have two refurbishing city trains in service and the remainder of those trains are served by classic high-speed trains. Um, customer feedback has been that uh, people prefer a classic high-speed train over and above a uh, class 170 train, which are the trains which uh, were replaced. Um, but we're keen to make sure we work with Angel and Webtech to deliver the full refurbished product because the customer feedback on that has been extraordinarily good. And my final question is, you, you may have spotted comments uh, uh, in the Parliament uh, made by uh, the First Minister who said this really is last chance saloon for ScotRail. Do you agree with that premise and do you feel that you can turn it around this time? Well, we're confident that the £18 million investment we're making in this plan is going to give our uh, customers the service they expect and deserve, and that is our total focus. Okay, so there, there are a few members who want to ask questions, and I, I will allow one question from each member just to allow for the time so everyone can get them in. So Maureen, go first, Peter, and then uh, I'll try and take Christine in uh, with one question. Quick question, so Maureen. Thank you, convener. Um, listening to radio uh, traffic problems, um, signalling is often given as a problem uh, for delays and cancellations uh, on our railways. Is the signalling uh, structure fit for purpose? I mean, my understanding is it's Victorian. We often hear of um, problems at Montrose. This week, there were problems between Inverurie uh, and uh, Aberdeen. Um, and I understand that if we improved the signalling, uh, we could speed up the Aberdeen to the central belt uh, without having to duel at uh, the Montrose Basin. Can I have your comments on that, please? So, um, signalling um, is a key part of any reliable railway system. Uh, and in fact, in the current period, uh, our biggest incident so far uh, is a signalling failure in the Haymarket area around a more modern type of signalling. It's one reason why we're spending 20% more money on the operations, maintenance and renewal of the network. And obviously, it's the responsibility of Network Rail colleagues to deliver reliable signalling infrastructure so Scott Rail can do a good job. And Liam here has got that as a key area of focus for him uh, in the coming weeks and months to make sure that we're delivering reliable signalling because that's a prerequisite for providing a reliable train service. I'll just reiterate the word I used, quick question, Peter, please. Well, going back to where I was before, uh, Alex, I spoke about the late delivery of the trains and the breach of contract by the companies that are doing that job. Um, can you give us some idea of what kind of money you are uh, trying to recoup from the, the fact that these uh, companies have let you down so badly? 
So, I mean, it's in the order of millions, essentially, uh, the penalties which are paid uh, by the suppliers who have failed so badly. And then, as I've said earlier, the way the franchise agreement works is where we don't fulfil our contractual uh, commitments, uh, we pay what's called a committed obligation payment adjustment to Scottish Government, which normally works back to back with uh, the commercial contracts that are in place. So these two sums of money balance out, is that what you're saying? Um, generally, they do, yes, but our focus is not actually on the money. Uh, our focus is delivering the contract to Scottish Government because by delivering the contract to Scottish Government, we'll deliver a better service to our customers. That's our, that's our focus. Christine, very quickly. Thank you very, thank you very much, Kinder. I just want to get back to this page 25 of your plan here. Paragraph 5, create a head of operations strategy to develop and maintain an ongoing three-year train crew resource plan based on future requirements. Why wasn't there somebody there before doing that job, making sure you had enough crew for the forthcoming needs of the ScotRail franchise? Because you're, just develop you're creating and developing now. So there's two issues here. Firstly, the issues that we saw uh, in recent months were not due to not having enough train crew. They were due to not having enough train crew trained in the new routes and the new uh, types of train. So that's separate from uh, not having enough train crew. In addition to addressing the training backlog at places like Edinburgh, which finishes this Friday, we're creating this additional post. We're looking further out into the future to give this area additional focus. It's one of the things we're spending £18 million on because clearly we never want to uh, uh, um, see these challenges again. OK, thank you. Uh, Alex, we mentioned earlier in your uh, one of your remarks about skip stopping and how you were eliminating it uh, in the last week I'm sure you'll have these figures to hand how many trains have skip stopped so a train skips a stop not just because um, we the control center is instructed with, it. The, with the greatest respect you've explained skip stopping to the committee and so, I'm so the number of, sure the number of, the number of skip stops is down by 85 percent since no, we implemented I, I'm the Donovan sorry, recommendation I asked how many trains had skip stopped in the last week I don't have that information to hand I can confirm well, would it, it would it surprise you that uh, just yesterday trains on the east coast of Scotland were skip stopping uh, on a regular basis, would that surprise you? And do you think that's acceptable? Because it's one of the issues that this government and this committee have questioned you on, and we were given an undertaking by the government and by you that skip stopping would stop, but it's continuing. So, Are you satisfied with that? So the Donovan recommendation was to stop skip stopping apart as, a, a, you know, as long, only use it as a last resort. So it's true to say that in the past we overused it. We have implemented the Donovan recommend, recommendation in full and the number of skip stops is down by 85%. So we only use it where that is the last possible way to so restore the train service. I, I think my question was straightforward. Are you satisfied in the last week that you, you have cut st skip stopping in line with what the government said would happen in relation to this? I'm satisfied we've implemented the Donovan recommendation. I've satisfied that we've cut skip stopping by 85%, which is what we've promised, and that's what we've done. Well, um, and maybe that's a point to leave it and, and let the passengers decide on the East Coast whether skip stopping has been appropriate. Thank you, Alex and David and Liam, for coming in uh, and giving evidence to the committee this morning. I'd like to briefly suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to depart before we take the next evidence session. Thank you.
now reconvene the uh, formal meeting of the Royal Economy and Connectivity Committee and move on to the second panel uh, to hear evidence on ScotRail. And I welcome Michael Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity, Bill Reevy, the Director of Rail, and Andrew Mackey, the Head of Rail Franchising Transport Scotland. Cabinet Secretary, could I ask you to give an opening statement of no more than three minutes? Please. Thank you, Convener. Um, as the committee is aware, I instructed Transport Scotland to use the available contractual level set out within the ScotRail Franchise Agreement to serve a remedial, a remedial plan notice. This notice was specifically required as a consequence of ScotRail's unacceptable level of cancellations in the east of the country, where the moving annual average threshold level for cancellations exceeded breach in period 9 of 2018-19. Yes, uh, ScotRail can point to the impact of late de delivery of trains and previous industrial uh, relations challenges, but these reasons are of no comfort to passengers in some parts of the country where service reliability continues to be woefully below requirements. If ScotRail is to address the unacceptable performance levels, uh, the steps contained within ScotRail's remedial plan must fix the specific contraventions of the franchise contract. Only through these key operational steps will we see reliable delivery of the planned benefits of the Scottish Government's record investment in rail, with more services, more seats, better reliability and faster journey times. You have heard from Alex Hines uh, and his team uh, on the commitments contained in the remedial plan aimed to restore the confidence of passengers and the Scottish Government. As the committee will expect, delivery of these commitments to the required timescale will be closely monitored and challenged by Transport Scotland. I have also instructed an independent senior industry specialist to closely scrutinise ScotRail's management of this critical plan. Let me stress again that the remedial plan must address the franchise contraventions which have frustrated passengers throughout Scotland. The duration of the remedial agreement will span to May 2020. This timescale is necessary, firstly to allow the full programme of contract commitments to be delivered, and secondly as a consequence of contractually tracking ScotRail's key performance indicators on a rolling 12-month basis. It will take this time frame to recover the lagging annual, av annual average calculation on performance for cancellations to fall below contract contravention levels. However, ScotRail can only achieve that by making improvements now to deliver solid week-by-week -week and month-by-month -month performance improvements. The First Minister was very clear at FMQs last week that ScotRail should treat the remedial plan very much as the last chance saloon. This is the nature of it. ScotRail has been left in no doubt that its recent performance levels have been completely unacceptable. And as you have heard from Alex Hines and his team on the recent positive trends in performance, particularly in the Strathclyde network, this is to be welcomed. But as a national uh, rail franchise, all parts of the country must be on a trajectory to meet this, to meet our challenging but achievable contractual regulatory targets. Professional and competent delivery of the remedial plan is now a mandatory step for the operator to retain stewardship of the national rail franchise. I will end my opening remarks there, convener, and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And the first question will be to Mike Rumbles. Mike. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, we have just had Alex Hines give us evidence, and he started off, in my view, the right way by apologising to those passengers who had uh, been receiving this unacceptable service. But when I questioned him, uh, he, he then seemed to be in denial uh, that the performance levels were that bad and that they were really improving and they were on the right trajectory. And uh, even when you've got... What I couldn't understand is Chapter 4 of the remedial plan starts with an analysis of the cause and the drop in overall franchise public performance measures. And it says, why has performance continued to decline? It's obvious, and as you've just said... Um, they have completely unacceptable performance levels. Now, you understand that, Cabinet Secretary. I think everybody understands that. I'm absolutely somewhat shocked by Alex Hines' attempt, if you like, to say that it wasn't that bad. Yeah. So, do you retain confidence in the ability of Bellio to deliver the required level of service 
and performance set out in the franchise agreement that which they took on in 2015. And if you do have that confidence in them, can you explain what gives you that confidence? Because the, the, the previous improvement plans haven't worked, and we're now on the remedial plan, and there seems to be a situation where Alex Hines seems to be in denial. So have you confidence in them? Let me try and unpick a few of the different issues that, uh, that Mr Rumbles has raised there. Um, I think, first of all, uh, the, is to understand the purpose behind the remedial plan, which is to deal with the very specific breaches of the franchise contract. As I mentioned in the Chamber yesterday, it's very specific uh, to take uh, get ScotRail out of those uh, breaches of the franchise uh, agreement. However, um, what that, um, uh, the reason we took that action is because of the unacceptable levels of cancellations in performance, particularly in the east of the country. Uh, it's not an action that you take lightly, um, uh, uh, because it's got serious consequences for the franchisee if they fail to deliver um, on any, uh, any measures which are set out within the remedial uh, plan. So I'm very clear, and the Scottish Government is very clear, is that performance has not been good enough, uh, particularly in areas such as the east coast. Uh, and the remedial plan is drafted in a way which is to address that specifically. Now, there is wider work that has also been undertaken in the network. You made reference to the improvement plan. Uh, the improvement plan, uh, which was in 2016, and then there was a, a further iteration of that in 2017, which led to the Donovan Review being instructed by ScotRail. We can see from some of the work that's been taken forward through the Donovan Review that there have been areas where improvements have occurred not on the East Coast, uh, and certainly not for the passengers who have been suffering cancellations uh, to the levels which they have been. But we can see in the West Coast that there have been improvements. So, for example, in the Strathclyde Electrics area, in the uh, particular in Central Station, PPM at Central is up at, at over 95 per cent. Uh, areas such as Mulgai, there have been marked improvements on on-time departures and the uh, Wifflets. So there have been improvements as a result of actions that have been taken through Donovan. But that also has to address wider issues within the whole of the network, and that includes uh, the East Coast as well. And that will take time for some of those actions to be taken. And as the ORR report indicates, they're making good progress, but there's more they need to do, and there's further actions that they could also, uh, also take. However, even with those improvements, people in the, uh, in the East Coast are certainly not experiencing that. And that's why the remedial plan is so important in addressing these issues. On your point around confidence in this matter, um, uh, uh, let me say um, I, um, I, uh, I asked to meet with the, uh, the chief executive and the chief financial officer of Abellio uh, in order to discuss the extent of my concern about their performance. Um, I met with them um, uh, in January, uh, setting out very clearly the extent of my concerns about performance to date the fact that we had gone into a major timetable change where there was clearly very significant assumptions made in that timetable change by uh, Scott Rail Abellio that had presumptions which were clearly inaccurate, which resulted in the crew uh, shortage and training issues, uh, which we can now, we're now having, to, they're now having to deal with as a result. Um, I've made it very clear to them that uh, the remedial plan is an opportunity for them to get this right. If they don't, it could have serious consequences for them. Uh, equally, the wider actions are taken around Donovan, I expect to continue to see progress uh, be made on these matters. So um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm of the view that it's clear from the remedial plan there is, uh, and from the discussions I had with the senior management with the Nabelio, there is a determination in their part in order to address these issues. How ultimately, the proof will be in the pudding and whether they deliver on these matters. Uh, and that's why I've also asked for an independent level of oversight on taking this forward so that I can get the assurances that I require that I can see them making the progress that they need to make. I'm glad, I'm glad you've, you've said that, um, Secretary. But I, if I can just pursue that with one more on that point. Um, Forgive me, I know you won't have this in front of you, but this is a private paper from committee members uh, produced by the clerks for us. And um, since Abellio took the contract in 2015, it seems from the graph that they have provided to us, uh, they've never, on the ScotRail public performance measure, moving annual average, they've never achieved 
the level that they're supposed to have achieving constantly in the contract since they took it over. And recently, the graph is almost falling off a, off a cliff at 87.5%. The trend is down. And um, I hear what you're saying, and I think it's absolutely right that you are holding them to account. But this is why my question focused on what confidence do you actually... Uh, you may be doing everything you can to make sure they achieve the objective of the performance lever, but do you really have confidence, it, looking at the past history of this company, that they can actually achieve the level that you're expecting them to achieve? Look, there is a... There's, it, I haven't saw the graph, as, as you, you made reference to. It's a committee uh, uh, paper. As, as the member will be aware, um, there are, and as you heard in evidence earlier on, there are a whole range of different factors that have an impact on uh, performance within our rail network, um, some of which were within ScotRail's control, some of which are not within their control. Um, uh, but there's a complex range of different issues that have an impact uh, on them. There is no doubt uh, that that has a, a accumulation of those has had an impact on performance over the last couple of years. Having said that, we can see that within the UK as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, that's not peculiar to Scotland. We have saw it in a downward trajectory uh, to the point where the UK government have commissioned the Williams Review uh, to look at the whole issue because of that. Uh, so there is a, what you call it? So there is a, there are, there are systemic problems within the system that are having an impact on uh, performance. There have been, alongside that, there have been issues relating to, uh, for example, recently the rolling stock issues, which you've already been discussing this morning, that have had an impact on ScotRail's ability to, uh, to take forward the new timetabling programme. Uh, uh, what I do believe is that. It, the challenges which we face just now are not due to a lack of financial resource on the part of the Scottish Government in investing in our railways. There are clearly issues about performance in both the infrastructure element and also in the rolling stock element of it. Uh, and both of them, as I've made at this point time and time again, both of them have to play their part in making sure we get better performance. Uh, what I, uh, I am uh, of the view is that uh, with the additional rolling stock that's brought in, with the measures that uh, are being taken forward through Donovan and also through the remedial plan, these should improve performance. But it needs to be sustained and it has to be maintained and passengers need to experience that as well. Uh, why do I say that? Because we can see some of the benefits that have already come, as I mentioned earlier on, from Donovan in the west of the country in the Strathclyde Electrics area. So if we can move, make improvements there uh, through the actions that have been taken, I want to see that in the we want to see that in the rest of the network. So my view is it can be done. Uh, what we need to do is to make sure there's a clear focus in both ScotRail and also Network Rail in taking the actions that are necessary to deliver that on a sustained basis, on a national basis. Okay, finally. Do you want me to ask yeah, Yes, I do want you to ask it, but I am going to encourage both of you to remember there are lots of other members around the table who want to ask questions and, and succinct answers to succinct questions will allow every member the opportunity to ask their question so I don't get evil looks when I don't allow people in. So, Cabinet Secretary, um, uh, short answers, Mike, please. Yeah. And finally, what role did you and your officials play in the development of the remedial plan and its adoption as a formal agreement? So um, the remedial plan was submitted to uh, Transport Scotland officials. Uh, it, they had the opportunity to review that. They also had external expertise brought in uh, to give some additional scrutiny to it as well. Uh, and then they uh, gave formal feedback to ScotRail on that issue. I don't know where, Bill, do you want to say a bit more about that particular process in terms of internally within Scot uh, uh, just, Transport Scotland? Just as you described, Cabinet Secretary, the, 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 we received the plan, uh, we subjected it to some scrutiny, including some independent expert advice. Uh, we took appropriate legal advice about how to make the plan enforceable. We went back with some required changes and after um, a proper process, uh, uh, um, we came to something that we were content to turn from the plan into an agreement. OK. Thank you. Uh, some follow-up questions then. John, uh, you've got one. Thanks, Convener. So following on from what um, you've been asked, how much of all of this problems do you think is an underlying management problem with Abellio ScotRail? 
and how much of it is just teething problems, basically, because there's been a delay in the rolling stock, we've grown things so much, we've put in the electrification, and any management would have had the same problems. Which problem are you referring to? Well, I, I mean, we've got a remedial plan here. It's a whole package of things. Yes. You know, is, could we say it's a 75% teething problems, 25% management? Well, look, um, uh, let me deal with that. Uh, there's a number of different factors. There's no doubt the late arrival of um, the Hitachi at Rolling Stock had an impact on their training programme. Uh, and uh, that continues to be the case. Um, uh, secondly, the uh, uh, late arrival uh, of the HSTs has had a similar impact. Um, that's also had an impact on capacity uh, on particular routes because where the 385 Hitachi trains are meant to go into it then allows the diesels to then be cascaded to other areas such as uh, the borders and to Fife, which has not been possible because of the late arrival and the delays then in training and then the knock-on effect to train drivers in these areas so to take on uh, the new uh, rolling stock that has to uh, that, uh, that's going to operate in the, in the east coast um, so they've whether it was publicly owned or anybody else had been running in the railways, these things would still have happened. Uh, well, the, 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 the failure in the delivery uh, on Hitachi and the high-speed trains is down to Hitachi and Wabtec, respectively. So that's, that's their failure. Um, uh, we can see early in ER, which is actually in public ownership run by the UK government, um, there's a late arrival of the Azuma trains there as well. So, would you call, so, there's, so it's, it's, not about, it's not about public or private. This is... Train manufacturers uh, or companies who are undertaking refurbishment work failing to deliver on what their commitments were. That's, that's the basic facts of that. However, it, the timetable change in December last year uh, was a significant timetable change, very significant timetable change to provide enhanced services. It was dependent on the new rolling stock being in in time in order to deliver that. Uh, the training programme and the crewing programme for that timetable change was an issue for ScotRail to manage and to plan effectively uh, to deal with that timetable change. Uh, they got it wrong. They clearly had made assumptions on the basis of the information that they were giving to uh, Transport Scotland that their uh, crewing and training plan uh, was achievable, although challenging. Uh, but uh, once the timetable came into place, it was clear that those were assumptions which were wrong. Uh, and uh, that's reflected now in the remedial plan in terms of the arrangements they're putting in place in order to address this with having a senior manager who will be responsible for oversight of this and also having a, a accruing strategy uh, which they will take forward in order to plan in these issues more effectively. So, combination of factors uh, and uh, they all interplayed at one time. Thank you. You've got a question. Yes, uh, um, it's uh, arising again from the question I made to Mr Hines. So aside from train cancellations due to ScotRail, there continues to be infrastructure issues like signalling, track issues, other delays across the rail network, which regularly impact on customers. So what are you doing, Cabinet Secretary, to manage the network rail's performance? And really, how much say do you have over network rail? Well, uh, there's no doubt that network rail infrastructure has an impact. Both parts of the system have their part to play in uh, performance. And there's no point looking at just part of the system and thinking, well, if we just keep saying that Scott will have to do X, Y and Z, that that will resolve all the problems. Because uh, uh, in some uh, periods, uh, in excess of uh, half of all cancellations and delays are the responsibility of infrastructure failures. Uh, uh, so there's clearly work that still needs to be done there. Uh, Andrew uh, uh, Haynes, who is the new chief executive of uh, at Network Rail, who is, is part of his 100-day review, has agreed to give greater devolution of the management of Network Rail in Scotland. So rather than it being uh, controlled in uh, is it Luton, uh, their headquarters, Milton Keynes, their headquarters, is that they will look to try and devolve more of the management into the Scottish uh, Scotland route. However, as an organisation, they are accountable to UK ministers. They are not accountable to uh, Scottish government ministers. Control over Network Rail. No, we, 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 we fund the work that Network Rail undertake here in Scotland. And I announced that just yesterday, uh, 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 some £3.8 billion pounds we will invest in uh, rail over the course of the next five uh, years, which is a 21% increase uh, in investment. We have an infrastructure manager in Scotland in Network Rail, 
for which we fund. Uh, but I have no response. I have, they've got, um, they're not accountable to me. So we Scottish fund government. something that we've got no control over? No, I don't, we don't, they're not accountable to us. <laughs> OK, thank you, Mr Lyle. The next question is Jamie Green. Jamie. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, with the good respect to the last line of questioning, it is the case, though, that Network Rail is the third party in the ScotRail Alliance, and ScotRail Alliance is directly accountable to yourself. Is that not the case? Uh, the, uh, Alex Hines is the, the head of it, is, but in terms of the actions of Network Rail, no. And isn't it also the case, looking at the remedial plan, that it states on page 15 that as infrastructure asset failures have caused 2% of trains to fail PPM in the past year. I know that's 2% too many in my view, but let's put this into perspective, Cabinet Secretary. In terms of um, uh, PPM, uh, the figure you're referring to, 4.11? Uh, 4.1.2, page 15 of the remedial plan. First yeah, the, line, the, asset failures have caused 2% of trails, trains to well, fail PPM in the past year. In terms of, if you look at, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the moving forward target in terms of infrastructure failures in causing uh, cancellations in uh, uh, and delayed trains, um, on average, uh, in excess of 50% of them are a result of uh, uh, infrastructure failures. So if you go to back to, for example, during the summer period there when it was very hot, over 70% of, uh, it was over 70% of all cancellations and delays were due to, uh, were due to um, infrastructure failures. So there's, Look, it's not a case of trying to blame one or the other. Uh, my view is, and I know when I say in the chamber and I raise this issue, members will say, oh, you're just trying to use network rail as an excuse for it. I want network rail to get it right as well. You know, they got it right there on the Highland Main Line. They've completed the uh, programme of upgrades there on time and under budget, uh, which is great. What we do, what we need is we need to see more of that. Uh, but where we have an axle counter at Haymarket that fails twice in the course of two days, that's unacceptable. Uh, we need to see improvements in these things. So it's not about uh, uh, playing off one against the other. We need both of them. We need both of them to, uh, to improve their performance so that passengers get the best service. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's, it should be all, the focus is all about passengers. Um, but uh, what I wanted to quickly ask was uh, uh, around uh, some of the issues that were mentioned in the previous session, which you may have, may have seen. Uh, we heard that it takes up to 18 months uh, to train a driver, a new driver. And, and ScotRail is part of this remedial plan, a flagship announcement was 55 new drivers. Um, on, the, on the face of it, what, what confidence does that fill that passengers will see any improvements anytime soon, given that substantial time lag from recruitment to being live on the service? It seems like a very long time before we expect to see the benefits of these new, this new resource. Thank you. Jamie, Cabinet Secretary. Okay. Two points in terms of the remedial plan on the East Coast to keep up to address the issues in the East Coast is the training of crew um, on both uh, uh, a, a traction and on route. Uh, and as you heard from uh, uh, Scott Rail this morning, is that they're on target to get that work completed, that training programme. So that will give them more resilience in the East in addressing the significant challenges they've had around uh, cancellations. Uh, going forward, they need to continue to recruit drivers because they still have a dependency on rest day working. And they have set out an expression that they want to end the need for that, and part of the additional recruitment will assist them to, to do that. But as you'll be aware, there are uh, potentially a, a variety of different things. One, it depends, the time frame can be longer, depends on where they're going to be based uh, and the types of trains that they're going to be covering, the routes they're going to be covering, that takes longer. If they come in as a, a ready qualified driver, then they just need to do traction and route uh, knowledge, then it can be much quicker. Uh, so there are different time frames, um, uh, which I think Scott Rail explained to you in their, in their evidence. But the key issue for the remedial plan on the East Coast is the completion of the training of their crew. Uh, and as I've said out, that they expect to have that completed by at the end of, I believe they said, next week. The question is John Finney. John. Good morning, panel. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. We're here a couple of hours, Cabinet Secretary, and I've not mentioned the Highland Main Line. I had no intention of mentioning it, but since you have, since you have, and very, very briefly, um, whilst the modest, modest improvements are most welcome, the greater part of that line remains a single track, which will pr pr provide considerable challenges. All the meantime, you're spending three billion on the adjacent road. But can I ask Cabinet Secretary a very direct point, and that is, can you set out what would happen? And when should Abellio not meet the contractual requirements set out in the remedial agreement, please? Uh, 
On the issue of the main line, he'll also be aware that the high on the main line is one of the lines we're looking at in control period six to see what further enhancements uh, we can uh, deliver in that particular uh, in that particular area, given its importance to the Highlands. Uh, the, uh, the remedial plan is now part of the franchise contract. Um, uh, if they fail to deliver on the commitments which are set out within the remedial plan, they go into default, which they are defaulting on the contract. Uh, and if that is the case, it, depending on the nature of that default and the purpose for that default, uh, as a government, we will then be in a position where we can consider where we should terminate the contract with them early. Uh, so uh, the next step for failure to deliver on it uh, could be termination of the contract. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, Peter, yours is the next question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, in your statement on the 22nd of March uh, uh, about ScotRail, you said, I have instructed my officials to ensure robust measures are put in place to monitor progress very closely. Can you explain what these robust measures are and explain how they differ from the current monitoring procedures? Um, uh, for the remedial plan, there will be uh, four weekly meetings uh, with ScotRail uh, to go over progress that's been made on the actions set out within the remedial plan. Um, I've also, uh, uh, I'm also appointing uh, Andy Thomas, uh, who is uh, uh, someone with considerable experience in the rail industry uh, and expertise, uh, to provide independent oversight of ScotRail's progress on that matter, which will report into my Transport Scotland officials uh, on uh, his view on the progress they're making. So that combination of uh, direct engagement with ScotRail plus the independent oversight that I'm putting in place will allow us to track very closely uh, the progress which ScotRail are making. So, I mean, I can see that that's, that's a useful increase in, in monitoring, but you, you, you could ask the question why it's taken this long to, to get to that situation. I mean, if, if, if monitoring closely is important, as it obviously is, why did, didn't we do some of these things previous? Because this, the, the monitoring specifically for the remedial plan. So, uh, so that's why that enhanced monitoring has been put in place. If it's in reference, if your point is about issues around crewing for the timetable change. There is a process that's gone through uh, for ScotRail to set out the plans and the arrangements they've put in place to manage these types of issues. Uh, I think it'd be fair to say uh, all of the assurances and information that was being provided by ScotRail prior to the timetable change was that they, uh, that they had some challenges, but they were all achievable, that they were all manageable, uh, and that they would be able to meet the additional crewing demands that would be required for the timetable change. Uh, but it's very clear that they're planning on that and information which they provided on that was wrong. Uh, and uh, the work that has now been undertaken by ScotRail to analyse in detail how they got it wrong, in part is reflected in the measures which are now contained within the remedial plan uh, so that they have a, a clear line of management within the organisation that's responsible for dealing with these issues. If you were to ask me the question, why did they not have that before? I would say that's a very good question. Uh, so putting it in place, in my view, is the right thing to do. Thank you for that. We've heard about the extra 18 million that the Alliance are going to put in to, uh, to help the situation improve over the next three years. Have any additional Scottish Government funds been made available to Abellio to develop or implement any of the proposals? And, uh, and, uh, and under what mechanism and from what budget line, if there is any extra monies? No, there's no additional money from the Scottish Government this matter. The £18 million pounds is entirely uh, uh, money which is coming from Abellio. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question is Colin. Colin Smith. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I think it says a lot about um, how low our expectations are of, of ScotRail that we're discussing how they're going to get out of breaching the franchise rather than actually hitting the targets that, that are being set. But, Cabinet Secretary, during topical questions yesterday, in reply to a question from myself regarding ScotRail's overall performance targets, you said, in a quote, ScotRail's forecast for achieving the 92.5% target is by the end of reporting period 13 in 2021, and they believe they are on track to achieve that. Do you stand by that statement? So I think 
I may have caused some confusion for the member in that response in uh, the chamber yesterday. The figure which I was quoting is the figure which is contained within the Donovan Review, the latter part of the Donovan Review, which ScotRail are working to. However, the figure which is contained within the remedial plan is for period 13 in 2021-2022. That's the figure that's been set, the trajectory which has been set by the ORR because of the work that they believe that Network Rail need to undertake in order to achieve the 92.5% target. But if, as you heard from ScotRail, though, they are working to the Donovan Review figure, which is for 2020-2021, period 13. However, in my response to Mr Smith's question yesterday, I should have referred to the remedial plan figure, which is actually 2021-2022, for the agreement, sorry, so my apologies for not providing him with the accurate information when I was responding to the remedial plan question. So, so the remedial plan is very clear. It says that uh, by uh, March 21, um, the performance figure will be effectively less than 90 per cent, so well below what that target is. Uh, and today, ScotRail confirmed that they will not meet the 92.5 per cent target um, by March 2021, which obviously contradicts the statement you made yesterday. They did say, however, they would beat that target by the end of 2021. Do you believe that's accurate and that's achievable? So I don't, I don't, in, in fairness, as I say, I, I apologise for giving them the wrong information yesterday, but I don't think it contradicts it. The figure which is in the remedial plan is the ORR figure. Uh, which takes account of what network rail need to undertake in order to achieve the 92.5% target uh, uh, within the agreement. Um, however, uh, the figure which I quoted you yesterday was actually the figure which ScotRail are working to, which was set out within the Donovan Review. So as you heard from Alec Hines earlier on, they are working to the Donovan Review figure, but the remedial agreement recognises the ORR projection, and that is the, the work that Network Rail need to take, meaning that it could take a year longer. Well, ScotRail are very clear they are not working to March 2021. They were very clear today they will not meet, or they do not believe they'll meet March 2021 figures. So can I just ask you, when do you think that ScotRail will deliver that performance target of 92.5%? So I may have picked up, I may have picked up uh, Scott Real wrong then because when I when I heard them giving evidence they were uh, that, the, that the figure that I offered up was the correct figure that they are working to. However, the figure which is in the remedial agreement is a different one. That's the one that's from the ORR. So they are still working. So, for example, if you as far as Scott Real are concerned, the new period starts next week. They should be working to reach the 92.5 per cent within the next period. Absolutely. The figure comes in, the 92.5% starts next month, period six. They are not going to meet that target. Do you think they're going to meet the target in March 2021 then? If that's the target they're working towards, are they going to meet that in your opinion? In this government's opinion, are they going to hit that target in March 2021? Because frankly, they, they made it clear today they didn't believe they were. Well, there will continue to be challenges in being able to achieve it, but they should be working to meet that target as best they can. Uh, and if they can't, if they can't... Secretary, the question is, when do you believe that ScotRail will meet that 92.5% target? Well, it, they should be looking to meet it, as was said out in the Donovan Review. Sorry, I, 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 Colin's pushed you quite hard on that one. I, I, mean, I think the question is, is when you think they will meet it, not when they should be looking to meet it, or what, what the figure is in which review. So when do you think they will meet it? I expect them to meet the target, as was said out in the Donovan Review which is for period 13, 2020-2021. To achieve that, if, if you were to look at what's in the remedial plan, which is a projection that says it would be below 90%, frankly, in March 2021, how do you believe that they're actually going to meet 92.5% by that period? Well, the, the range of actions that they can take in order to improve performance are all the measures which were set out in the Donovan Review in order to achieve that particular target. If they continue to make progress with those, then it is possible that they can make that target. What I want to do is to keep them focused on that uh, and to make sure that that is the date that they are aiming to achieve target on. And if they fail to meet that target by March 2021, if that is the target they are working to, what action will the government take? 
it depends on how much they've failed it by and the reasons as to why that may have been the case as well. Uh, but clearly, if performance is not picked up on where it is at the present time, then we would have to look at taking further action. Ken, I want to bring Mike in and then I'll come back to you if I may. Um, Mike. Pursuing the point that Colin Smith has raised, as I understand it, the earliest time you can give them notice of breaking their uh, of, of terminating their contract mm -hmm. is April next year. Um, it sounds to me from your your um, responses that um, you're not even expecting um, Abellio to reach those targets until another 11 months later. And considering my question earlier on that they've never achieved the target, they never have since they reached the, 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 they took the contract. So we've got poor performance through their whole track record. Would you not? Con uh, don't you think it would give them a, a major spur if you if you told them that you would be examining at the earliest opportunity whether to end the contract? Would that not give them a greater spur? Well, they already be aware of that. So, but let's keep in mind is that if they fail to deliver on the commitment set out in this remedial plan, which they have to start implementing now then any of those which fail to meet the timeline that's set out in the remedial plan give us the opportunity to consider whether we terminate the contract or not. Would you consider so we don't, so we don't, we don't, we don't have to wait yeah. until okay. April next year so, so uh, you... in order to make, to make, that, to make it, that decision if they're already, if they're going to default on the remedial plan. So if they do that in April next year, will you be thinking about it or would you t make an assessment of whether you should give them notice to end the contract? As the First Minister has already said, they're in the last chance saloon. Okay. So if they don't get it right, uh, they, that should make it very clear to them as what the potential consequences could be. Colin, I'll come back to you. So the problem is, when they fail to hit a target, sometimes that target changes. And actually, it's not just about hitting a target. It's about a certain level below a target before you actually take any action against ScotRail. So looking at the remedial plan, you've indicated that, Cabinet Secretary, that if they do not meet what's in the remedial plan and the timelines in that remedial plan, eh, the franchise could be terminated. Could you expand on that and actually say what that means? If they fail to miss one of those timelines, will it be terminated to those timelines? By how much will they have to fail to meet that timeline to have it terminated? What exactly is the criteria that you will use? Because previously it wouldn't have been in breach effectively in breach of their performance targets. Um, those targets have been amended, frankly. So what exactly, within the, the, the remedial plan, uh, targets will they have to breach and by how much before you seriously consider terminating this franchise? So if they, because the remedial plan commitments are now part of the contract to get them out of breach, if they fail to deliver on it, they go into default, which is the next level. And if they're going to default in their contract, we then have the opportunity to consider whether we should terminate the contract. In asking me uh, what exactly will it be uh, that will determine whether you terminate the contract, it depends on what the purpose for the default may be. So say, for example, if they default on one of the commitments on the basis that they were a day late in doing it, does that justify termination of the contract, uh, even though it was only 24 hours late? Uh, or is it something which we now know actually they're just not going to be able to achieve it at all and they're not going to deliver on it and they're not intent on delivering on it? Does that merit us giving consideration to terminating the contract? So when you ask me for the very specifics, what will it be? It de does depend on a number of different factors. Uh, and as I say, if it's something where it's clear that they are not going to deliver on it or are incapable of delivering on it uh, and there is no will for them to deliver on it, then we would have to consider where we should terminate the contract on that basis, because they are failing to deliver on a contracted commitment that puts them into default. But as I mentioned, if it was something which is a day late, um, or it was a small oversight that uh, caused a delay in them actually uh, completing a piece of work that can be uh, closed off within a relatively short period of time, uh, that has not adversely impacted in the wider benefits that have been gained from the, uh, from the medial plan, then clearly we'll have to give consideration to that as well. Jamie, you wanted to ask a brief follow-up, and then we'll go to Stuart Stevenson. Thank you. I, I mean, this is getting as clear as mud as, as we progress through this conversation. There are 19 contractual commitments in the remedial plan, but it's entirely unclear as to how many they will have to fail to meet before you will consider terminating the contract, given that some of them are not expecting to be achieved until 
May 2020. So, in effect, you're giving them carte blanche to continue as is with no real teeth to the threat that you may remove the franchise. They only have to fail to deliver on one. It's not, it's not several. One. If they fail to deliver on one of those commitments, they're in default. So this is to get them out of breach. This, if you go into default, you're the level below that again. So, and that automatically gives us the right to consider where we should terminate the contract as one of our options. So it's not a combination of different uh, issues that have to be breached. It's just one of them uh, that automatically gives us that ability. Hopefully that's cleared up the mud for him. Thank you. Stuart. Um, given that we're talking about uh, potential end of the contract, how prepared is the government to uh, put in place an operator of last resort? So we uh, legally have to put in place um, an operator of last resort uh, and we have a arrangements in place uh, for an operator if that was uh, necessary. Uh, that's a piece of work that's regularly reviewed. Um, Bill can say a bit more about the internal work that we do around that, uh, but uh, we've got legal arrangements in place should we need to step in as operator of last resort. Did you say legal arrangements? Uh, well, we have, we've, got le we've got arrangements in place and legal contracts in place right. to Sorry. deliver an operator of last resort if required. No, I just misheard you. Okay. So, so, so not, not very much to add, but we do have... Uh, some shelf companies uh, ready as, as a standard practice for the eventuality um, uh, that might be required. Uh, we do keep the operator last resort arrangements under review. We're refreshing those, uh, that process as we speak. Um, Andrew has in his franchise management team a team focused on that piece of work. That is good and prudent practice. We've done that throughout the life of this franchise and indeed the previous one. That's um, standard operating practice for us. Um, there are issues about the whole structure of railways and the Williams Review addresses that. I know my colleagues will ask about that, so I'm not asking about the Williams Review. Uh, but in, in general terms, um, there has been a discussion about Scottish public sector organisations, perhaps uh, being a follow-on operator or bidder for the franchise. Um, the, the only name I've heard so far is Carmack. Um, I... I have a view that they've perhaps got enough in their in train trying to run the ferries. Uh, can you assure me it won't be Carmack? Uh, because I can hardly imagine that that's going to make things better. <laughs> or indeed that you personally take control of it, uh, Minister, much as I respect your uh, capabilities, uh, I, I suspect it might be beyond your personal reach. Probably more within Bill Reeves's personal reach than my personal reach. But, um, uh, we, have, uh, we, have, we have secured the, the right to a public sector bid for a franchise. Uh, David McBrains are the only company in the public sector that have expressed an interest in uh, possibly bidding for a, a franchise. Um, uh, uh, they, as a, ultimately, as a public body when it comes to uh, the opportunity to bid for a public sector contract, they would have to um, assess uh, uh, it, 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 their decision to, uh, uh, to lodge a franchise bid uh, and the issues that go alongside that. Um, I, I don't, if someone else is going to ask me about the Williams Review, however, uh, this now feeds quite strongly into the whole Williams Review because, as we know, Keith Williams has already said that the existing franchise structure uh, needs to change. Uh, so we are facing change uh, uh, of some shape or fashion, what we don't know is what the nature and scale of that change will be, but it's clear that, from what Keith Williams has said to date, the existing franchise arrangements are not going to continue. We're going to come on, sorry, if we're, going to, we're going to come on to uh, the franchise arrangements at the moment. So, Stuart, uh, my question is, are you satisfied that you've got an answer that you don't need to be worried about who's taking over control? Uh, well, I've heard what the Cabinet Secretary has, has had... had had, had to say, I, just as a supplementary, though, it's been suggested to me that uh, the cost of preparing a bid is in the order of 10 to 15 million pounds. Of course, it would be what it is. Um, if Carmack were to spend, a, or McBrain's rather, the company who own Carmack, uh, would spend that money, would that be useful spending of money, or would we would rather better seeing it improving ferry services rather than? 
But the, 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 the cost to uh, the cost to prepare a bid for a franchise uh, uh, a franchise bid is in the region of around it's in the order of around ten million pounds. Um, that's not to secure the contract. That is no, no. just to prepare your bid and to submit your bid. John, John Finney, you've got a question there. Yes, indeed. Um, I don't share Mr Stevenson's concerns about CalMac. Um, um, and, um, um, but what I would like to ask is what the, the operator of last resort looked like in advance of the Scottish Government being able to prepare a public sector bid. Because you've said there was a legal requirement, that there was something in frame. What did it look like before then? You, in what way? Well, do you mean... Who was it? What was it? How was it configured, Cabinet Secretary? The operator of last resort. Yes. I'll ask Bill Dees to explain. I think, I think, just as I said before, that we, 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 we maintain um, the, the shelf companies ready to, to start if we needed. We keep uh, under review. Being what, please? Uh, being a company prepared and, and, and ready to be taken off, off the shelf, sorry, a shelf company, um, ready to be taken off the shelf and used as a legal vehicle. Um, to, so to allow us to take over as the operator of last resort. Uh, we keep the um, uh, key contracts of the current franchisee under review. There's, we have a, uh, a standard um, uh, uh, pack that we keep under review of the information we would need, the process we would need to follow. Uh, we stay in close liaison with uh, colleagues at the Department for Transport who have been through this process on a couple of occasions now and make certain we're kept uh, up with best practice and we keep that process under regular review. So we, we've maintained that ever since we've had responsibility for franchises in 2005. Are you able to see what it looks like, who it is? is, is it, because clearly we're not going to engage a whole new lot of staff. It is presumably a well, is it senior it, personnel. It, it, you know, just to take the example of, uh, of where the Department for Transport has stepped in in the, the operator last resort, which would be a, a similar model. Uh, typically, it would entail the transfer of uh, all but a small number of senior managers from the existing operator. Um, they would be tupied into the new company, uh, and there would be a need to fill uh, some senior posts with people with appropriate experience. I can't say who that would be, because we'd need to find out who was available at the time, but we do have means of securing people of suitable expertise. So terribly complicated. It's therefore very disappointing that the Scottish Government seems to have completely cooled on this, and we've heard a lot of comments about public ownership. But I'll leave it there. Thank you. Richard, do you want to come in briefly? I think uh, John says leave it there, but um, if ScotRail or not can't solve it, why should we give it to another franchise, another private company? Why don't we take... What is it? What's, what's the word that they're using nowadays in this Brexit? Take back control? Should we not take back control of Scot? We're putting millions of pounds into Scottish railways, millions of pounds. So why don't we take it back under public control? Let me deal with Mr. Um, Lyle's issue and Mr. Finney's issue. The idea that the Scottish government is completely cold in this uh, is, is, is. I'm, I'm struggling to hear. There's some conversations going on. Sorry, could you? So let me deal with uh, the, is completely cold in this issue. That's factually wrong. Uh, that's not the case at all. Uh, what we have got is we have got um, uh, we've got the William review, which is taking place at the present moment, where they've already indicated franchising of its existing nature is going to change. What we don't know is what that change will be. And what I said to the Williams review is that I want all options on the table, including the ability for us to look at a public sector run railway as being an option. And including alongside that the full devolution of network rail so in Scotland. So can I hold on, can I, can I just finish this point? So 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 when Mr Finney says that the Scottish Government can I, hold on. So when Mr Finney says that the Scottish Government appear to have cooled in this issue, he's wrong. What we're dealing with is a changing situation because of the Williams review, which we need to take into account. Now that takes me on to Mr Lyle's issue. And that is, why don't we just take back control of it? Well, we can't just take back control of it because we don't have the powers to be able to do that. We don't have the scope. We don't have the, we legally, if we um, are, if we are uh, in running rail services in Scotland, we are legally obliged to have a franchise in place. All we have is the right to be able to have a public sector organisation to bid for a franchise. Now, my view is that the existing franchise arrangements 
don't work in the interest of passengers. It's no longer fit for purpose. It needs to change. We need to see greater integration of the infrastructure elements, network rail, and also the rolling stock providers, whoever that may be, whether it be public or private sector. We need to see a complete realignment of how rail services are delivered. And that's why I want to see, through the Williams Review, if franchising is ending, that is to be welcomed. But if this franchising arrangement is to be, well, uh, to be ending, I want to see the options that allow us to consider all the various models that could be applied in Scotland that allow us, including, to pursue the option of a public sector rail service in Scotland. But it needs to give us the powers to be able to do that, not just on the rolling stock element of it, but also on the network element of it as well, around network rail. And that's the opportunity that we have with the Williams Review. And from the discussions I've had with Keith Williams, that's the views that we've expressed to them that we want to see coming from the Rail Review in the UK. Okay. Hopefully that clarifies my position for Mr Finney. Cabinet Secretary, I think, I think the, the next question is around that. And, and Jamie, that's, that's your yes, question. Yes, I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for answering the question I haven't asked yet. Um, so, uh, it's a unique ability. <laughs> Indeed. Um, it is an important point. I want to sort of take the politics out of this. Uh, there's a lot of discussion around who owns the railways and the nature of the franchises. But, I mean, what it comes down to in the conversations I have with the industry is that the problems that the industry is facing at the moment, even if, with respect, David McBrain took over the railways tomorrow under some shelf company arrangement, at the end of the day, anyone can set up a shelf company. It doesn't actually mean you're running a business. Um, they would still face the same problems with weather, disruption, driver shortages, late delivery of fleet uh, and rolling stock and so on. So, you know, what realistically, uh, you know, your, your, your view that you want the flexibility and the options to do it a different way, but what makes you think that it, things would be run any better, any differently from how they currently are? Well, that's why we want to be able to look at all of the options to see is there a better way than the existing franchise arrangement that we have at the present time that could provide us with a more passenger-focused uh, railway service with greater integration between the uh, infrastructure element and the rolling stock element of the way at the present time. No one is going to persuade me, given the recent challenges that we have had, that we have got the optimal model for running railways in Scotland. Is MD going to seriously argue that? Uh, because that's clearly not the case. What we need to do is identify is what is a better way in which to run our railways in Scotland. And that includes the possibility of having it within the public sector. But for those who, and the member does may raise a number of important points, for those who say to me, including some around this committee table, just tear up the Berlioz contract. What it doesn't do, it doesn't resolve the crewing issue. It doesn't resolve the issue about the late arrivals of trains uh, coming from Wabtec and from uh, Hitachi. It doesn't get us any more drivers. It doesn't deal with the infrastructure challenges that we have within the Scottish route as well. All of these challenges are still there. The challenges that we have at the present time cannot be magicked away. We need to find a way in which to try and work through it. So in trying to improve uh, uh, services for passengers, my focus is on what can we do with the contract that we have in place to apply as much pressure as possible on the franchisee to deliver for passengers? And one of the uh, uh, biggest elements I, or one of the strongest elements I can pursue is through a remedial plan that then puts into the contract. So if you're in breach of it, you go into default on the overall franchise. So uh, we've got to use the contract that stands at the present moment to try and maximise the benefit for passengers as best we can, and that's what my focus is at the present time. But that bigger picture, it's clear to me, is that we don't have an optimal model. Uh, I think the UK, it'd be fair to say, and I can't speak on their behalf, I think the UK government have now woke up to that as well, which is why the Williams Review is taking place. Uh, the question now is about what comes from Williams. We've already got an indication the existing structure is going to change. Franchising of this nature will come to an end. What will the future look like? And our engagement with them is very much focused on we want to be able to look at all options in Scotland, including the devolution of network rail so we can get greater alignment between rolling stock and infrastructure, infrastructure as well, and at the same time the opportunity to look at different models for how we run our railways here in Scotland, including through a public sector option. Uh, thank you, Government Secretary, for that.
uh, robust answer. I, I, I do share some sympathy with what you're saying in respect of the problems that we're facing today won't go away overnight and ripping up the existing contract and replacing it with a new one under a different legal framework doesn't necessarily remove any of the problems that, that ScotRail faces. But I, I did uh, pick up, a, I would say, a hint of criticism of the ScotRail Alliance and what you said. You said that you would prefer a more passenger-focused railway in Scotland. Those are the words you used in your answer to me. Are you therefore implying that ScotRail is not passenger-focused at the moment? And what is your vision, therefore, of this public run rail network that you would like to operate? But what, what I'm saying is when I, when I refer to Scotland, I'm talking the rail network in Scotland um, as a whole. Uh, I do think, although I know for passengers they may not feel that from a discussion I've had with ScotRail, they want to deliver the best possible service for passengers that they can. Um, uh, there are, uh, we're clearly going through a period where they've got aspects around training and crewing wrong. Uh, uh, the purpose behind it was to provide better passenger services. That hasn't materialised yet. That's a source of real frustration to me, given the amount of resource that we are putting in uh, to rail to help to deliver better uh, services. So I think there's a, I, I don't want to. I think it'd be unfair for me to say that I don't think Scott Rail uh, are interested in trying to deliver uh, good services p for passengers. I believe they are, and they are committed to doing that. Where I do think there is a need for it to become more passenger focused is on the infrastructure side. The infrastructure side to me feels too detached, too remote, uh, too process driven and not passenger focused. And there is a need for that to change so that they see that they have a much closer role, a much more uh, focused role on the work that they can undertake in order to uh, reduce the risk of disruption to passenger services. To me, at this time, that doesn't feel to be the case. I also happen to think the regulatory framework that we have in place at the present moment is also too inward-looking, uh, that it is not uh, focused on uh, uh, focused on passenger needs to the level that it should be. Although I welcome the ORR's suggestion that they are looking at the possibility of fining senior managers within uh, uh, Network Rail for failure to deliver um, on uh, performance. You know, it, it, that to me is uh, it, it might be welcome, uh, but. Uh, we should have been focused on driving better performance in network rail at a much earlier stage. And the regulators get our own carrying that out. In my view, it's, it's, it's not served that purpose as well as it should have. Um, briefly, if, if it's time. Yeah, it's entirely up to you. Thank you, Convener. Um, so, uh, just following on from this line of questioning, um, clearly the structure of the current franchise means that one of the parties is a Bellio, a, a, a private operator. We know that the £18 million is in the remedial plan that we've been discussing all morning is coming from them or from ScotRail as opposed to coming from public funding. So presumably, therefore, uh, the risk that a Bellio takes or any other company that, that operates a franchise would be transferred to the public purse. At which point will the Scottish Government come forward with proposals or plans as to the cost considerations of a fully publicly owned and run service with 100% of that risk on the public purse. We would expect, obviously, you to, for you to be forthcoming with such plans. This is dependent on what comes from the Williams Review uh, and what the extent of the powers will be that we have. Uh, does it give us the power to be able to look at a completely different model here in Scotland, including the possibility of us having a public sector run uh, railway in Scotland? In doing that, there's a variety of different models uh, that could be considered. They would all have to be worked through uh, and considered um, as well. So we are. Uh, it, it, we need to. We need to see what comes from the Williams review. What we do know is, so far, is there's going to be significant change. The question is what the scope and nature of that change will be, uh, and that will then give us uh, the opportunity to consider how we then take that forward here in Scotland. But I, I've been very clear with my engagement. I'm due to uh, our officials have engaged, have submitted uh, material to the Williams Review. Uh, we've continued to have engagement. Um, I'll be looking to further engagement with them as well, because uh, they're due to report by the end of this year, um, around uh, making sure that Scotland's needs are being taken fully into account on any changes that they're planning and that we should have all of the levers of power around what those options should be for running the rail services here in Scotland. Secretary, the next question is from Gail Ross. Gail. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, um, panel. Cabinet Secretary, I want to move on to customer satisfaction. And the latest figures that we have from August 2018 tell us that it's at its lowest at 79% now. 
And um, that's obviously prompted the second remedial plan that's due with us on the 3rd of May. And I asked Alex Hines about it earlier, and he said that around the 30 aspects of service that's looked into, um, the greatest um, disquiet, if you like, uh, which is not a surprise, is around punctuality and reliability. Um, can you provide us on an, uh, with an update on that plan from your point of view and what you think should be in it to improve the levels of customer satisfaction? So, uh, as um, Gil Ross has mentioned, it's due to be with us by the beginning of May, which we will go through the same process that we've gone through for this remedial plan. plan. We will consider the detail that's contained within it take advice, uh, including legal advice, and then we will uh, feed back to ScotRail on that uh, and the aspects that we believe need to be either included or that need to be expanded upon within the actual uh, remedial plan as well. Uh, two key areas are absolutely no doubt uh, how uh, they can take actions that address issues around punctuality and reliability. That fits in very much from what we get from uh, from uh, the transport focus uh, uh, feedback uh, is two key areas. Um, one of the areas that they need to give uh, much greater consideration to is uh, advance warning to passengers. So if your train is going to be cancelled or your train is going to be delayed for whatever purpose, is giving people as much advance notice of that as possible. Uh, this is an issue which I've raised with ScotRail in my discussions with them before. Um, uh, there is nothing more frustrating, and I've been there myself, where you turn up for a train uh, and it's cancelled. Had I known that an hour earlier, I could have made alternative arrangements uh, to go a different way or by a different means. Uh, so that earlier notification uh, will be extremely important, I think, in helping to inform passengers, uh, because it's a major source of frustration, I know, from the feedback I get from passengers. Uh, and they, they need to look at how they communicate that more effectively. Um, another, um, another thing that annoys people, and you can see why, is skip stopping. Are you satisfied that that's come down to acceptable levels? Is any level acceptable? Well, it's now... Um, uh, I suspect there's been a level of... Uh, skip stopping has always taken place within the system at some point uh, as a way of just managing uh, at rolling stock and the uh, and lines. So it, I don't think it's a it's a new thing to the industry. I think what looking back historically in the last couple of years, it has been overutilised by ScotRail. Uh, there have been significant reductions. I think it's almost 85% reduction on the number of. Uh, 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 skip stopping that's taking place. Uh, it should be an absolute minimum. It should only take place as a matter of last resort. Uh, there are processes in place to monitor that as well. Uh, so through the contract, and that they are only using it for that purpose. Um, uh, so I would always expect it to be used as nothing more than a, an issue of last resort. Uh, uh, and uh, I think the fall-off that we have saw over the course of the last year, that's part of the Donovan review being implemented. We have saw a significant drop in, uh, in uh, uh, skip-stopping taking place. You talk about giving passengers advance notice if their train is cancelled or delayed, but how do you give them advance notice if you're going to skip their stop? It must be intensely frustrating to be waiting to get off at the stop that you've maybe got somebody to pick you up from or, you know, that's closest to your house, and that's why you get off there, and a train just rushes through it. So, uh, and I think part of that is uh, uh, communication from on the trains uh, to passengers, uh, not just that they're doing it, but explaining why it's the case, because for some time, some occasions where it's not clear to people why has it happened in the first place? It could be because there's a broken down train somewhere else, and if they stop there, it's going to cause even bigger problems. It's a ripple effect uh, within that particular line or into other lines as well. So they make a decision looking at the network, thinking if we skip that stop, then uh, I know it inconvenience passengers, but actually it reduces the wider inconvenience it will cause from an even greater number of passengers who may be impacted because of a particular issue that's happened, whether it be rolling stock or infrastructure failure that's taken place. So it should only ever be used as a matter of last resort, but clearly communication to passengers is critical and explaining why that's the case as well, uh, that they're having to do that so that passengers have an understanding 
um, it, as to why that why it has occurred and why it's been put in place. Is there any form of um, compensation to reimburse passengers that might then have to get an alternative form of transport home if, if they can't get off at their stop? I would need to check the exact details of that. There are the delay and repay uh, uh, system, but I don't know if it covers the uh, skip stopping, but I can check that for, Thank you. Uh, for you. Thanks. Is there? Uh, Andrew, Andrew, can yep. you? So, in the event um, where there's a park cancellation and a customer um, is affected by a, a service that is stopped earlier or a skip stopped, then that passenger is eligible to claim delay or pay um, if, it's, if the delay is more than 30 minutes. And if they have to get, say, a taxi to their house, which they wouldn't have had to get if they were allowed to get off at their own stop? Yeah, well, I'm aware that... The, um, a lot of customers make representation to ScotRail um, for um, over and above compensation where they've been um, inconvenienced at a short notice and it was required a taxi. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the committee? I, I, I've got one, Cabinet Secretary. I've been slightly heartened today that you, you, you agree that the most important thing is getting it right for the passengers who travel on the train. What, what I find kind of difficult to understand is every time that we get into a discussion in this in the chamber that it, it seems to be that blame is is passed to other people and I was looking at the moving annual average for delays and if you exclude delays due to external reasons which we all know what those are unfortunate events and and people on the line and you exclude the extreme weather it's clear that uh, for the annual moving average the biggest delays are caused by ScotRail and not Network Rail. Why do we therefore just continue to blame Network Rail where the figures actually prove that it's ScotRail that's more at fault than Network Rail? Um, I don't blame either or. Both of them have a part to play. Uh, but it seems to be the answer is that, oh, well, if we had control of Network Rail, all the problems with ScotRail will go away. But that is not true. No, I, I don't, I don't, in, in all due respect, Convener, I don't think today I've come in here and said it's all because of Network Rail. There are occasions when it is Network Rail and there are periods when the majority of the cases might be Network Rail. And there'll be times when it's ScotRail. We need both of them. I, focused I, on delivering for passengers. I, uh, no matter how, how few or how many they are responsible for, they both have a part to play. And my view is the present time and the present structural arrangements don't allow that to be as focused on passengers' needs as it should be. Okay. And the idea that we fund, Scott, we fund network rail investment here in Scotland in the next five years to... Uh, you know, two, two, four point uh, eight million a billion pounds worth of investment into our rail uh, system. That uh, we have an infrastructure manager on network rail that is not accountable to the well, government that's funding the infrastructure investment. That simply isn't right. Well, I, I, it needs I, to change. I think, in fairness, I look back when I was looking at these figures the other day, and I, I, I can give you examples where Alex Hines has blamed network rail, where where you have blamed network rail where the First Minister has blamed Network Rail. But in the last year, it is clear that the figures show that more of the delays are due to Scott Rail than Network Rail. Well, so can we, my, my plea as, as somebody who uses the railway is to make sure that we all work joined up together to get the best result, rather than looking to blame other organisations. So, so long all organisations share responsibility, surely. Well, let, let, me, let me take an example in blaming Network Rail. Uh, the axle counters that failed twice at Haymarket last week were because of network rail, mm -hmm. not Scott Rail. The consequences of dealing with that were for Scott Rail to deal with. The communication of that problem was undertaken by Scott Rail. It wasn't undertaken by network rail. I watched the communication from Scott Rail saying problems being identified. Network rail are en route. They are en route on site. They've identified what the problem is. It will take an hour for the part to arrive. The guys are trying to replace the part as it stands at the present moment. It will take X amount of time to be completed. What did we get from Network Rail? Zero. Right. Now, the point I'm making to you is that that's an example of where there has been a failure on the part of the infrastructure provider, where they need to be communicating that more effectively to the public so that the public understand that. I'm not playing one off against the other. But what I think is also important is that if we're looking at our rail network and holding it to account, we need to be able to deal with 
both parts of it. And right now, we don't have the power to be able to do that. And, and I think, Cabinet Secretary, the point that I, I'm making is that a lot of the, uh, those ScotRail delays are due, and according to the listing here, is, is defective trains, lack of train staff, which also affects other rail operators, not just the one in Scotland. So maybe, maybe we can leave that there as an observation. With, with due respect, Convener, I, I hope that you don't think it's all just ScotRail's fault, that you also recognise that Network Rail need to deliver on their responsibilities as well. Absolutely, I accept both. Good. And, and if you heard what I said at the beginning, that I don't like blame being shifted to other people when other people in the form of ScotRail, as it appears in the last year, are more at fault than Network Rail. So, on that note, Cabinet Secretary, I, I'd like to thank you and your team for giving evidence. I am briefly going to suspend the meeting just to allow the witnesses to change over, uh, and I would ask members of the committee to stay in place, please. We move back into session and I'd like to move on to agenda item three, which is subordinate legislation. This is the formal consideration of motion S5M16261 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity, calling on the committee to recommend that the Motorsport on Public Road Scotland Regulations 2019 be approved. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity to move the motion and ask if he'd like to make any comments. Oh, sorry. 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 I have jumped a page in my excitement as we got close to the end of the meeting. So I would say uh, I'd like to uh, welcome, before I ask him to do anything else, uh, Mike Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport and Infrastructure, George Henry, uh, Head of Roads Policy Transport Scotland, and Stephen Rees, the solicitor. And before you move it, Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make a brief opening statement in relation to that? I apologise for getting that out of order. Thank you, Convener. Scotland has a long and proud tradition in the world of motorsports. We want to recognise that and allow it to continue by permitting the holding of stage rallies and other motorsports events on Scotland's road network. However, motorsports can be dangerous and we recognise the need to balance the potential for public enjoyment and economic benefit from, events, uh, from such events with a high degree of safety, both for spectators and participants. Since the tragic events at the Snowman and the Jim Clark rallies in 2013 and 2014, which resulted in four fatalities, no motorsports events have been held on closed public roads in Scotland. Since then, we have had the benefit of learning a number of vital lessons from the government-led Motorsports Safety Review and the detailed and thorough fatal accident inquiry into those fatalities. Real steps have been taken to implement the lessons learned and the current self-regulation -regula enforced by Motorsports UK on rally events is now much stricter than it was before the tragic incidents occurred. They have now published the fourth edition of the Stage Rally Safety Requirements, which has evolved into a comprehensive safety document covering all aspects of staged rallying. The Scottish Government also uh, informed a uh, Motorsports on Closed Roads Advisory Group consisting of key stakeholders including Police Scotland, Scots, COSLA, both the Jim Clark and Mew, uh, Mill Rally Organisers uh, and Motorsports Governing Bodies, Scottish Borders Council and Active Scotland. All of these bodies were involved in designing both the public consultation and the draft regulations. We received an impressive 3,788 responses to the recent public consultation 
on our proposals for these regulations, with 98% of respondents backing the proposed two-stage two application process. The draft regulations in front of you propose on two-stage authorisation uh, process for motorsports events on public roads, which put both the motorsports governing bodies and local authorities at its centre. This brings together the people with the greatest experience of running such events uh, with those who have the best interests of their communities at heart to ensure that events are delivered as safely as possible. In developing these regulations, we have examined what happened in other, what's happened in other parts of the UK and we have refined our regulations as a result. The first steps of the application process require an event organiser to approach the relevant motorsports governing body to obtain an event permit. This will involve consideration of the proposed route, the proposed public safety arrangements and whether appropriate insurance cover is in place. It will involve close consultation between the motorsports governing body and the Roads Authority and Police Scotland. Once a permit has been issued by the relevant motorsports body, the second step of the process requires the event organiser to seek the approval of the Roads Authority to hold the event in the form of a motorsports order. The Road Authority, which for roads other than trunk roads, will be the relevant local authority, must consider factors such as the likely impact on and benefit for the local community and the views of the local community. The authority must be satisfied as to the public safety measures and traffic management measures proposed before it grants a motorsports order for an event. As we are talking about public roads, it is anticipated that local authorities will close the roads on which the event is to be run using existing powers in relation to special events that they have under road traffic legislation which was amended to allow them to use those powers for motorsports events. In conclusion, we believe these regulations set out a robust and proportionate framework for the authorisation of motorsports events on public roads in Scotland, and I hope this proves useful to your consideration of the draft regulations. Thank you, Cameron, etc. And it's a good job we didn't jump forward to the next bit because there's lots of questions, and the first one is from Stuart Stevenson. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. I very much uh, welcome this order. I think uh, uh, it's an exciting sport and so on and so forth. But um, as we move towards uh, electric vehicles on our public roads generally, uh, and indeed on the racetrack, we now have Formula E, which is races among electric cars. Have we had any indication from Motorsport UK, the organisers, or anyone else who's been involved in this, uh, that there may be categories specifically for electric cars and a move towards such rallies being uh, driven by electric rather than, uh, uh, than uh, diesel and uh, petrol cars? Uh, well, I, we haven't had any specific uh, representations on this matter, but I've got no doubt as more and more electric vehicles come onto the market that it will find its way increasingly into uh, stage rallies um, as well. It would really be a matter for those uh, organising the event, uh, whether the vehicles had to be electric or not, or whether it could be a, a mixture of uh, a combustion engine and electric vehicles. Uh, but it's, um, uh, I, I suspect as we go forward with the greater number of electric vehicles will probably see a greater number of them being used in, in rally sports events. Thank you. Uh, Richard. Yeah, I certainly, again, like my, my colleague, welcome this. I think it will bring a, a benefit back to the, the borders and, and it will be good for the area. But uh, I see that there was a review and the review recognised there was an inherent risk in taking part or attending motorsport events and it sought to recommend possible reasonable proportionate measures. In your opinion, uh, has, uh, uh, has this review uh, reduced the risks and ensured it will be minimised? So, as I mentioned, there have been significant changes to the governing bodies and the rules that they say are around uh, hosting these types of events, and they've now got a, uh, a more robust and stricter regime in place for dealing with safety and uh, 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 spectator areas, etc., spectator zones and the arrangements that they have to uh, put in place. So there is a, a much more robust mechanism uh, in place, which has now been used by the national governing bodies. And a key part of any event organiser in applying for a permit to the national governing body for a 
for a permit is that uh, safety is at the very heart of that decision-making process. And they need to be satisfied uh, that uh, the safety arrangements which have been put in place uh, are sufficient, meet their standards and their expectations. Uh, and then once they uh, receive that permit uh, and they apply to the local authority, uh, the roads authority, for uh, for an order to uh, have the event, then the local authority also needs to be satisfied that the appropriate risk assessments have been undertaken and that the right safety measures have been put in place. So there's no doubt the system now is much more robust than it was previously, and that's been informed by the review that's taken place and also by the fatal accident inquiries uh, that have been undertaken and the outcomes from those. Uh, the next question is John Mason, followed by Jamie Green. Uh, thanks, Convener. I mean, I noticed the public consultation was from the 3rd of December to the 28th of January. Uh, there were quite a lot of responses, 3,788. Um, and the plan is to have the next rally on the 24th of May. I mean, I'm just wondering if the whole process has been rushed a bit, uh, because I think the com committee's not getting quite as long to look at this as we normally do. Has the, are we rushing it a bit? So the... Yeah, the, the, just on the basis of, we did get a large response. 98% uh, of the respondents uh, were in favour of what's being proposed here. The, uh, there is more time for the event organisers. Uh, if they, uh, uh, the 24th of May, if they were, uh, they could have it later in the year. Um, uh, once these new these regulations have been passed by Parliament, though, they will have to comply with these uh, regulations. Um, uh, but they can use the existing regime with the enhanced provisions, which is already in place from the motorsports governing bodies. Uh, uh, but once these regulations are in place, then they will have to comply with those. Well, but are we... The, the fact that it, it says in Graham Day's letter to the convener that um, we're fulfilling the 40-day statutory laying period but not the 54-day convention, mm -hmm. are we rushing this through in order to fulfil the May deadline? What it will do is it will give them the opportunity to consider looking at having an event later in the year once these regulations are in place. So if we don't put these regulations in place just now, they won't be able to have an event. They won't be able to actually uh, undertake an event in the way in which they would wish to uh, because the regulations, uh, they would run out of time. But it gives them more time uh, to be able to look at having an event later in the year if we put the regulations through at the present time. Do you want to say a bit more about that, George? Yeah, I think the, the initial in, um, information that came from the Jim Clark rally had suggested that they wanted to run on the, the 24th and 25th of May, um, but that is subject to them gaining approval from Scottish Borders Council and Police Scotland. Um, to, to answer your question directly, uh, are we rushing them through? The, the answer is no. Um, if you wish to um, consider the regulations longer, then you have that ability to do so. Um, information that came in later, uh, just yesterday, is that the, the Jim Clark rally may look to extend um, and run the event maybe later in the year, uh, potentially in August. But what that would do, um, they would still need to have gained authorisation from Scottish Borders Council and Police Scotland ahead of the regulations being formed. Uh, Jamie Green. Jamie. Thank you, Convener. Um, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and the work of his team and his directorate for this? It's an important uh, uh, subject and one which will affect many parts of, of Scotland. It will provide many welcome opportunities to uh, introduce or reintroduce uh, this type of event to boost tourism, especially out of season tourism, and also support island communities such as Mull as well. So it's very welcome. But I think this is off the back of, unfortunately, a very tragic events. So, um, I'd also like to, if I may, with permission from the community, to pay tribute to David uh, Richard from Motorsport UK for the tremendous work he's done on, on the subject. Um, but on the issue of, of, of local decision-making versus national guidelines, can I ask what role the Scottish Government will play in issuing the appropriate guidelines that will assist local authorities to make the decisions that it needs to make to ensure uh, that public safety is, is at the forefront of any events which are held? Well, the new, uh, the new regulations put uh, public safety at the very heart and every step of that particular process, because it's now a two-stage process. So the national governing body need to be satisfied that 
uh, safety, public safety has been addressed and also safety for drivers, uh, that those measures have been addressed. Uh, and then the local authority also needs to be uh, satisfied that a full risk assessment has been undertaken, uh, engaging with Police Scotland around safety ma matters as well, uh, and also with the national governing body, that they are then satisfied that all of the safety arrangements are in place from the council's point of view. So there are two checks now in the system at the national governing body level when you're asking for the permit, and then before you can get the order, the local authority then considering uh, 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 what safety measures and arrangements have been put in uh, place. Uh, with the orders, we will look at what further information needs to be provided to local authorities to assist them with them uh, in doing that. Uh, but the, the new system is, is, a much, is a much cleaner, uh, a much more uh, safety-focused system than what has happened uh, previously. And that's learned the lesson specifically from the fatal accident inquiries that we had. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie, the next question is from Rachel Hamilton, followed by Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you, Convener, and um, thank you, Cabinet Secretary and uh, members of this committee for the opportunity to discuss this SSI. I just wanted to um, say how important the Jim Clark Rally is to the borders and to Berwickshire in terms of tourism. Um, recently, uh, there have been shop closures in Duns, and I believe that uh, this rally will provide uh, um, further footfall and bring a little bit of economic generation mm. that we have missed over the last few years. Also, um, exciting news that the Jim Clark um, Museum is opening soon and that will attract more tourists. Um, as we, you said, the organisers are speaking closely with SBC and Police Scotland and it looks as though there could be um, um, a postponement of the date from perhaps May into August, as George Henry has said. I want to ask the Cabinet Secretary, in the light of these timetable constraints, um, would there be any commitment of goodwill from the Scottish Government in terms of resource, either financial or otherwise, um, that could be provided to reinstate the, the rally, which is so important to the Scottish border's economy? Um, and and do you know, Rachel, I'm going to let you get away with making that comment, but it's not specifically on the SAI and, and, and the obligation of it. So, Cabinet Secretary, you can answer it very briefly if you want to, but you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Yeah. Thank you. There is a, there is a, to try and be helpful, there, there, is no, there is no plans on our part in order to provide funding, uh, although I suspect their engagement is more with, um, uh, with uh, events, Scotland, etc., where, where they can possibly provide support and uh, some form, uh, and I'm not sure what the discussion are with those uh, organisations around helping to promote the event, which Event Scotland can help to assist in doing and to attract more people to uh, uh, to the area. Uh, there is provision within the regulations, though, for the local authority to be able to set a fee, uh, which allows them to recover some of the costs that they may incur um, as a result of undertaking the work that may be necessary for issuing an order. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, Peter Chapman. Peter. Yeah, Cabinet Secretary, I'm looking at, at Schedule 2, uh, which is a table of statutory provisions disapplied by a motorsport order. And the bottom four, the bottom four items there, it, things that you don't have to have, as I read it, you don't have to have obligatory test certificates, you don't have to have a, a driving licence, and you can do it when you're even disqualified. So we, we're proposing that somebody that's been disqualified from driving can take part in these, in these rallies and, and run around the countryside at horrendous speeds. Is that correct? I'll, I'll maybe ask uh, Stephen to maybe just comment these a bit more and give you a bit of background to them as well. Um, so the provisions that are supplied by Schedule 2 are um, various provisions which might um, um, be problematical if you're trying to hold a race or rally on the public road. Um, obvious ones such as speeding, following traffic signs, that kind of thing. The ones that you mention, um, the requirement for test certificates, I think, relates to, uh, to um, vehicles. And obviously, vehicles participating in race or rallies may not conform to normal, um, the normal requirements of, of road-going vehicles. Uh, the requirement about driving licence and being disqualified is because, um, as I understand it, it is possible for drivers of or participants in these events to not actually have a regular road-going driving licence. I think you can participate in rallies from the age of 16. So, um, the, hence the requirement not to have a driving licence and the requirement, the disapplication of the requirement to, uh, 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 for driving while disqualified uh, I think was just taking the view that it, it flowed from the requirement, the fact that there's no need to have a driving licence, so um, uh, the, the, uh, the two things aren't necessarily connected. 
these, these aren't dissimilar from the rest of the UK. Uh, the, the regulations here are broadly reflective of what provisions are put in place for these types of motor sports events across the rest of the UK. But I, I find that absolutely extraordinary because, you know, the, the whole focus of, of, of why these, the, the rallies were stopped was, was a safety issue. And surely uh, you would require somebody that had been disqualified from driving for obviously, obviously something that did seriously wrong and uh, allowed to take part in a rally. I think that's absolutely incredible. So the, this is a self-regulatory uh, regime. So the body that regulates these matters is... Uh, uh, at Motorsports UK, um, who set the criteria for those who are participants and, uh, uh, and, uh, and taking part in their events and the requirements which are set, uh, which is the same across the rest of the UK, and our regulations are broadly reflective of what, uh, what exists across the rest of the UK, apart from the regime which we've put in place in terms of this two-step process. OK, uh, the next question. Uh, I think the final question will be Stuart Stevenson. Is it correct, and maybe Stephen Risu can answer this, that in fact you cannot participate without a competitor's licence issued by Motorsport UK, and that the standards required to obtain that licence are significantly more stringent than that for a public uh, roads driving licence? I'm not actually, I have to confess, I'm not aware of the specific requirements that Motorsports UK uh, do or do not impose on uh, participants, but certainly. There's nothing to prevent Motorsports UK imposing uh, more stringent requirements on participants and the disapplication of the provisions in Schedule 2 uh, um, uh, doesn't prevent uh, uh, more stringent requirements being imposed on, on participants. The number of the point is that Motorsports UK set the criteria for those who could be participants in these events. Um, and I was wrong. It wasn't the final question. Mike Rumbles would like the final question. Yeah, I, I would like to ask, following on from... Peter Chapman's question. I'm just focused on the driving while disqualified. Um, as I understand it, SSI, you either approve it or you don't, so we can't amend it. Um, and I'm not particularly persuaded that because it's the, we've done this in the UK, we can do it here in Scotland. We, we're not responsible for UK legislation. We're responsible for legislation here. And it's our responsibility that we should take as to whether we think that's appropriate or not. Um, I don't think it's appropriate, um, but I'm very, very reluctant, and I, I, I wouldn't do it, is to oppose, the, <coughs> oppose this um, SSI for that reason. Um, but could I just make a plea for any future SSIs that we have a look at this, um, rather than asking us to uh, approve it? So I, I don't like approving something I'm not happy with, okay. but... but but recommending to approve for the parliament to approve it, um, I just think that it's. I, I'm hearing comments to, to my left, which, if you could just just contain yourself, um, would be helpful. Um, continue. No. Yeah, I'd like to continue. I have an issue which I am not happy with, and I'm trying to articulate that. Uh, and, and, and everyone, please, could we let Mike finish with the, the point he's making? And I know, Richard, you want to come in in a minute, so I'm very happy to bring you in. Mike, could you thank, finish thank you, what you're you. doing? And, and is there a question there yes. that you'd like the Cabinet Secretary it, to answer? It, it is. Considering that you've just said that it's Motorsports UK that gives the criteria, it would be helpful, I think, in passing this order, if you could pass on to that organisation our concerns about this, or my concerns and Peter Chapman's concerns. Yeah. More than, more than happy to do that. I think the members raised a reasonable point, and I also ask uh, Motorsports UK to uh, uh, to write to the committee, mm. uh, setting out the criteria which they use that may give greater clarity around the uh, uh, the way in which they apply these regulations. That would be helpful. I also think the point that Stuart Stevenson has link, made is linked to that because I do think they have their own licensing system for those people that want to race motor vehicles, which includes a certain health uh, and, and driving capability. And it would be helpful, I believe, for the committee to know that for, for future reference. Richard, you wanted to come in? I say that surely if people learn on uh, motorsport tracks, people learn in Formula One. How many actual uh, uh, great drivers? actually have a public driving licence? Um, I, I can partly answer that question, that to take part on 
on-road racing, you have to have a motorsports driving licence, which requires you to go through a stringent test and, and uh, uh, also a health assessment. I'm talking about a UK driving licence. But you might not have a UK driving licence to have that. You, you would have a one issued yeah. by the British exactly. Racing Drivers Association, I think it is. Exactly. If I'm right, George, is that correct? Yeah, I think that the competitors' license, obviously, Motorsports UK hold that, and they um, and they obviously cover all that within um, their handbook. Okay, I'm in danger of sounding like another member of the committee, so I'm not going to go any further on that line. Is there any, Peter? This really is the final point on this, and that, and, and that'll be it, Peter. Right. Thank you for letting me back in. I I highlighted four points at the bottom of this uh, schedule two. And maybe, maybe we have answered the question about the driver's licence and, and, and a better licence to take part in comp competition. But the bottom one says, users of motor vehicles to be insured or secured against third-party risks. So surely you, you, would, you would imagine that these, these drivers would need to have insurance in place, and yet you're saying that that's something that they don't need to have? Organisers, it's the, the, event, the event organisers have the insurance cover in place. Uh, again, this goes back to the self-regulatory nature of it, is that for them to obtain a, a permit uh, for host, so if you want to host an event of this nature, the Jim Clark Rally, the event organiser will have to go to UK Motorsports and they will have to put their uh, proposal to them and that will have to include appropriate insurance cover. Uh, for the event, uh, and they have to then be satisfied that they've got that insurance cover in place before they can then grant them a permit. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. As there are no more questions, we are. We, no, sorry, Deputy Convener, do you want? Okay, we're going to move on to agenda item three, uh, which is the formal consideration of motion S5M16261 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity, calling on the committee to recommend that the Motorsport on Public Roads Scotland Regulation 2019 draft be approved. Cabinet Secretary, uh, I ask you formally to move the motion and ask if you want to make any further comments. Moved. Thank you. Therefore, the question is that, as a committee, are we agreed that motion S5M16261 be agreed on the understanding also that we will be provided more information on the driving licence provisions as discussed at this committee meeting? Yes. Agreed. We are agreed. Thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, thank you for your participation in this. Uh, the committee will now move on to the next item on the agenda, which is subordinate legislation. This is the consideration of three negative uh, instruments on EU exit instruments as detailed on the agenda. I would say that no motions to annul or representations have been received in relation to these instruments. Is the committee agreed that it doesn't want to mend... Sorry? Stuart. I missed you. Um, it, just, just a couple of observ observations and a question uh, on the uh, uh, on the sea fishing licensing foreign vessels EU exit etc. Order. Um, can I just welcome? Uh, I know my constituents very much welcome. The instrument will prohibit uh, foreign ves fishing vessels from fishing within the Scottish zone without first obtaining a license from Scottish ministers. I think this is uh, something that my constituents have long thought uh, should have been, been in place. Um, so I welcome that on, on their behalf, if I may. But in particular, uh, in, in looking uh, at, uh, at this, in the policy note, in the second paragraph of it, it says, although this order is made uh, to prepare for UK EU exit, it is not made under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Uh, so, so therefore, I, I have a question to which I think I know the answer, but I kind of need to have it formally, that this could be done without leaving the EU is what it sounds like, but probably isn't. And I, and I would just think on the back of, I'm, I'm going to support this, I'm not trying to overturn this at all, uh, just to get clarity as to what scope there is for doing this independent of the issue, when, in what way, or if, uh, leaving the EU is, because it's a very encouraging thing for my constituents. Uh, uh, does, please, 
I also very much welcome this. This is something that's been that's been uh, required for some time in our, the fishing industry in, in the North East. Certainly, well welcome it. But my my query is, you know, that it, that this this says that no foreign vessel will be allowed to fish in our waters without a license. But it doesn't say anything about what will be the criteria taken into account to allow a, a foreign fishing boat to obtain a license. It says nothing about that. So I just I I, am, I, I wonder. I, uh, I wonder how uh, this will operate in, in practice, uh, how easy it will be for foreign vessels to obtain a licence and what they will have to say and do uh, to, to gain that licence, and it doesn't explain that, and I, I, I would like the, some clarity on, on the subject. Okay, uh, Rich Law. Yeah, actually, in the House of Commons, when that word was used, foreign people actually didn't like that. I think we've got to say, when... Um, there is a European. There are European uh, boat owners who actually uh, operate out of Scotland and do have a part of them. So it won't exclude European uh, fish uh, uh, fishing boats because uh, there are European owners who own uh, access to Scottish waters. Thank, thank, thank you for that, Stuart. Uh, just, just to make uh, the observation, the key thing is that this order brings them in so that Scottish regulations apply to all vessels in Scottish waters. At the moment, if you're a Spanish vessel or a Dutch vessel fishing in Scottish waters, Scottish regulations don't apply to you. That's the key point. Uh, uh, Mr. Lau, Mr. Lau, please. Um, sorry? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll find out. Um, Spanish. Right. I, I'm not sure that I, I'm qualified to, to make an opinion on that, and I'm not sure anyone around this table is. So there are a couple of questions there that I think that we need to take back um, to the government, which we can do legitimately. One is to ask if there are other legislative means of doing this, apart from the way that we're being asked to do it. But we are being asked to do it in a specific way, and that is what is on the table. And we can also ask right to the Scottish Government to ask how people can obtain a licence. Again, it doesn't stop us uh, from considering the motion. So my proposal is, is to ask you as a committee whether we are agreed that motion S5M16261 be agreed to. Agreed. Sorry. Oh, God. Sorry. I almost... I've got to keep... Right, I'll tell you what. I'm going to organise my folders. It's been a long meeting. And I'm saying, is it, is it agreed, subject to those comments that I made, that, that the committee does not want to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? OK, I'm glad we've agreed that. I apologise twice now to the committee for getting things out of order. I will try and get it organised next week. And thank you. That concludes the meeting, which I now close. <laughs>